Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Nice to see you all. I'm Dan Gorodnik, Chair of the City Planning Commission and Director of the Department of City Planning. Uh, we are joined today by Vice Chair Knuckles, Commissioners Benjamin, Bozorg, Osorio, Cerullo, Dweck, Gold on Zoom, Kermani, Marine on Zoom, and Rampershad. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. I expect that many of you tuned in to the Mayor's State of the City address uh, this past Thursday, where he outlined an ambitious working people's agenda for New York City. He spoke about advancing green energy, improving health care, bringing housing and jobs, safety, and much more. Uh, his address included significant news related to the potential creation of homes in Manhattan's Midtown South, which offers direct access to great jobs and transit, but where zoning prohibits housing today. So uh, at the Department of City Planning, we're really looking forward to collaborating uh, with the local community, council members Eric Botcher and Keith Powers, and Borough President Mark Levine to develop a thoughtful plan to get this done. Uh, looking uh, back uh, just a little further than uh, last week, I wanted to thank the approximately 200 people, phenomenal turnout, who attended the January 17th Atlantic Avenue Mixed Use Plan kickoff information session. Atlantic Avenue Mixed Use Plan, which is referred to as AIMUP. So if you're wondering how to pronounce it, it we, we are going with AIMUP for the suggestion of the local council member, um, Crystal Hudson. The session resulted in many folks sharing ideas about what they would like to see along the stretch of Atlantic Avenue and on neighboring blo blocks in Crown Heights and Bed-Stuy. Uh, like the work Mayor Adams focused on for Manhattan last week, this plan seeks to bring more jobs, also housing and income-restricted housing, to a central area of Brooklyn where housing is, again, currently prohibited. A big shout out to Council Member Crystal Hudson, our facilitator at WXY Studios, and the Department of City Planning staff for getting us off to a great start on this one. Now, today's agenda. First up, we have a special presentation for the Commission uh, and all of our viewers out there today on this administration's City of Yes for Carbon Neutrality proposal. Uh, this key mayoral priority is the first of what will be three citywide text amendments that we at City Planning are advancing. You'll hear the details in a few moments, but uh, please note that we are in ongoing and direct consultation with communities, elected officials, city agencies, and key advocacy and stakeholder groups as we continue to shape these proposals. There'll be much more to come on this, including on the two other citywide text amendments for economic opportunity and for housing opportunity. These priority projects seek to make the city more resilient while creating family sustaining jobs and housing across all of our communities and across all income levels. After that, we have presentations related to many new opportunities for new homes, especially income restricted homes and jobs that are starting the public process today. First up, we're going to have a presentation on the Melrose Parkside Historic District by uh, Kate Lemos McHale and Timothy Fry from the Landmarks Preservation Commission. After that, we'll hear about a proposed building, building in Bensonhurst with 100 homes, 30 income restricted and ground floor retail. This project would be steps away from the 71st Street D train stop uh, and the uh, Petrosino Playground. After that, we're going to hear about a self-storage facility being proposed in East Flatbush. Out in Bayswater, Queens, we'll learn about a 100% affordable building with over 100 homes, uh, income restricted, 20% of them supportive, plus community facility. Tenants of this resilient project in the Rockaways would also have access to open space via Bayswater Park and transit via the A-Train and a new daycare center. And one more new housing project for today, a 100% income restricted proposal for Melrose in the Bronx, which would bring 200 homes, including 30 supportive homes near Lincoln Medical Center, Governor Smith Playground, and multiple schools and subway stops. Finally, we've got a long agenda, so I'm, we're bracing ourselves here. The commission will hear about a proposed two-story commercial development in Charleston on Staten Island near Outer Bridge Crossing which would include retail space and potentially create about 170 new jobs. So 
that's our agenda. With that in mind, Ryan, I'm going to turn it over to you, and we will get to work for the day. Thank you all for being here. Certainly. Uh, just want to note, uh, one, the time is 1.08 uh, p.m., and a quorum is present here in the room uh, at 120 Broadway. Uh, we have a special presentation on the City of Yes initiative. Our Director of Zoning, uh, Frank Ruschala, is here to present. Hello, Frank. Welcome. All right. So um, what we wanted to do today is to give an overview of the kinds of issues and general goals of our carbon neutrality work. Uh, give a little bit of the history of how we got to the things that we're looking at um, and give some examples of the kinds of things that um, our, our proposal would look to address. Um, as Dan was saying before, uh, we've been looking at these issues for a bit and really trying to talk to as many people as possible, make sure that like we're hitting the right issues to accomplish these climate goals. Um, so ask away, and if you have any other ideas, we are more than welcome to hear them. So um, first, kind of maybe a simple starting point, but it is kind of important to lay it out. Why are we talking about carbon in the first place? So in 2016, uh, the world community joined together uh, to sign the Paris Agreement, and that was a vision to curtail human greenhouse gas emissions in order to limit overall global warming by a maximum of two degrees Celsius, um, and thus present, uh, prevent any environmental or the larger environmental damage that would be associated with more warming. Um, here in the United States, when we talk about greenhouse gas emissions, that is predominantly um, carbon dioxide because for, in the U.S. case, Carbon dioxide represents about 80% of the U.S.'s uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and importantly, most, almost all of that um, emission comes from human-centered work, whether that be the combustion of fossil fuels, uh, gasoline, natural gas, things like that, things that you may see in a car or even home heating. Those are many of the ways that greenhouse gas is occurring in the country. Um, and in New York City, as a way to try to meet this climate goal, um, the city has been looking at this under this concept through a number of different initiatives under the broader, over, broader concept of 80 by 50. And what that would do is reduce the city's greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by the year 2050. So how would we get there? Um, so... When we talk about this, we talk about this as the concept of a carbon neutral city and would really take three big moves um, that would affect a lot of things in the city, whether that be buildings or transportation. But in general, these kind of big things would get us to be able to achieve this goal by 2050. So the first thing um, would be to reduce energy needs. And the way to do that is going to be re retrofitting the you know, hundreds of thousands of buildings in the city to lower their overall energy use. It's a sort of massive part of the work that needs to be done. Um, and you can see that like buildings that shown in blue really is the largest contributor of greenhouse gas um, in the city. Second, if you sort of lower the amount of energy each building or thing needs, you not only need to do that, you also need to clean the energy grid itself. And so that means moving away from things like fossil fuel and moving more toward things like solar and wind generation, and particularly those things being close to the city and requiring a lot more storage in the city for that energy. And then finally, um, looking at retrofitting and, and updating not just the sort of, uh, sort of making sure that buildings and vehicles all in the city really are electrified. And so that is going to take electric vehicles, how to, you know, making sure that there's storage capacity for electric vehicles, um, and also electrifying buildings. So there's a lot of technology that would have to be updated in buildings across the city to be able to meet this. So there's all, this is not a simple thing. Um, this is a massive effort that it's going to take. And zoning, I will say, is not the only thing that is going to get us there. Um, <laughs> as much as we may you know, love it to be. Um, but it is a thing that is actually going to be important and will show some of the things of, of, of what we've learned over time on this. Um, a lot of this work builds on things that have been done over the last decade. Actually, um, city planning, the City Planning Commission approved a text amendment in 2012 called Zone Green, uh, which was the first time that the zoning rec resolution recognized things like solar power and solar panels. They just didn't exist when zoning was written. Um, 60 or so years ago. 
Um, it also reflects the work of the 8550 roadmap, which is the city's attempt to try to figure out how it would achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. It builds on the work of a lot of practitioners, so people who have been looking at trying to retrofit buildings or build energy infrastructure in the city um, have been trying to identify the issues they faced, some of which are zoning. And so in 2018 or so, the Urban Green Council pu published a report called Zone Green Er, and the idea of that was trying to collect all of the issues that practitioners were seeing with the current zoning, but then also any other issues within that too. It also builds on some of the city and state legislation that's been passed in the last few years, um, particularly, for example, Local Law 97, which requires large buildings in the city to uh, lower their energy use significantly or begin to face fines over the next, next coming decades. So what would we look to do as part of this? Building on all of that work, the core things that we've identified as being necessary to, in zoning to look at. Um, first is just removing zoning impediments. Um, there are just numerous times, a lot of just technical issues that people have identified where you're trying to, for example, put new solar panels on your roof and you happen to actually run into a zoning issue. Um, and many of those times, just there was being issues that no one intended to be there. They just happened to be written in the text in a way that kind of causes that problem to exist. And so given the overall goal of trying to meet those that climate goal, we're looking to remove as many of those impediments as we possibly can. Second, there are some places in the zoning where the zoning resolution tries to incentivize people to make their building more energy efficient gives slight um, allowances for thicker walls, for example. Um, these things were put in place in 2012 as part of Zone Green, and people have identified over time issues with those, um, with those actual incentives, many of which um, make them harder to work, and many of which actually have kept them out of line with more changes in the New York City Energy Code since Zone Green was put in place. So there's just a lot of cleanup that needs to happen to make sure that when zoning is incentivizing things, it's actually doing it at the like best moment today in 2023. And then finally, given the importance of the cities and states' solar goals um, and battery storage, energy storage goals, um, really making sure that zoning is not particularly getting in the way of those two pieces, um, just because they are such an important aspect of the goal of getting to 80 by 50. So four key areas, um, and these key areas should not be surprising, they actually match the four areas that were listed in the 85 by 50 plan to actually reduce to that percentage. Um, so the first thing is uh, focusing on energy, supporting um, the greening of the grid, really trying to make sure that we um, allow solar and wind power to the greatest degree possible. Um, but not just the, the energy generation, but also the storage of power itself, um, which is something that is just new to the zoning resolution and really hasn't ever been considered um, since zoning was put in place. Um, when it comes to buildings, what we've found over time is there are a lot of ways people are trying to retrofit their building um, to make it more energy efficient. And um, depending on what they're doing, they're running into some zoning issues. Just again, it's like a lot of technical things, but it's enough to make it hard or impossible to actually do that retrofit. And so if we're talking about needing you know, all of the buildings or most of the buildings in the city to retrofit, those changes build up very quickly over time. Third, if we're talking about transportation, particularly when it comes to electrification of vehicles, um, for the most part, this is not zoning. Zoning doesn't typically get into these kinds of issues because it's really the public streets and the kind of public infrastructure. But there are some times where zoning actually does act as an inhibitor to even things like um, electric chargers in parking facilities. And so those kinds of things we want to try to address. Um, and then last, a thing that zoning often doesn't really touch and a lot of other regulations do, but when it comes to waste and water, um, there are times and issues that people have identified where zoning actually becomes the thing that makes it hard for someone to do. For example, I'll show an example of like a rain garden, which is something that's very useful when it comes to storm water, but is something that the zoning doesn't actually often allow you to do. So I'll go through a, like 
five quick examples that kind of get at some of these issues, and they really try to address that range of things that we'd be looking at. Um, so the first are solar panels. So in 2012, we put in place regulations that actually recognized solar panels were a thing. So before that, if you were trying to put them on your roof, DOB wouldn't actually understand how they were regulated because zoning just didn't even consider them as a concept. And one of the things that was done in 2012 was there were limits placed on the height of those solar panels and the overall area that they could take up on a roof. Um, and while this was put in place uh, as sort of thinking about what was needed at the time, people have identified situations where the zoning actually limits the amount of solar panels that you can actually put on a roof. Um, in this example, the building is taller than what zoning permits, and that's true of a lot of buildings that were built before zoning rules were put in place. And this building is limited to being able to only put solar panels on 25% of the roof. Um, this is really counter to the idea that like we need as much solar power as possible in the city. And so this is something that we would look to address by removing that 25% cap um, and expanding that to 100%. This is actually something in the Gowanus Special District two years ago that we actually changed when we recognized that this issue existed. Um, but this is the kind of thing we just want to bring across the city because it actually is inhibiting people from doing things. Um, energy storage, um, so if we've created the capacity to generate power through changes that mean make it easier for solar power, um, we actually have to store that close by in the city. And so this is something where zoning regulations, again, doesn't exist, weren't really thought of with this in mind. And so there have been a number of situations where people are trying to put batteries on their land or on, in or on top of their building and are running into zoning issues for it. Um, and so this is a lot of a situation where just no one knew what this was when zoning was drafted, even in 2012. And so this is a kind of thing that we want to make sure that we update zoning regs to be able to recognize, but also to be able to broadly allow. Because the idea is that we're going to need energy storage kind of dispersed throughout the city. And as it is now, you either can locate in a manufacturing like district, um, but if you were wanting to, say, in a residence district, have any energy storage, you really don't have many options, particularly as of right. You're either going to the BSA, um, and that can be a really lengthy process. And so given the scale of need, this is the kind of thing that we want to put in place as of right rules to actually allow people to put energy storage um, in or on their building. Um, building retrofits. Um, so as I identified before, like generally people try to retrofit their building in whatever way makes sense for them. There's a lot of different buildings and a lot of different contexts. One example that we've seen as a big example of a problem is if you have a building that was built before current zoning rules were put in effect. So this could be a pretty large office building in midtown Manhattan. Um, zoning rules actually don't allow the building to be that large. Um, and if you wanted to retrofit your building, you're probably going to change your facade. You probably have to change your facade from a really thin facade, which was put in place 30, 40, 50 years ago, to something that's thicker because that actually is more energy, uh, energy efficient. If you try to do that, you can't because you have run out of floor area. Your building is already larger than it is permitted to be, and going any further is uh, illegal. And so there have been numerous buildings that have actually run into the situation just trying to <laughs> retrofit to be more energy efficient. We want to try to address that. Um, while we did make it easier in some instances, this is a great example of a situation that we never caught 10 years ago when we did the first text. Um, electric vehicles. If you go around the world, uh, different cities, you will see electric charging is located much more than you see it in New York City. There have been New York Times articles about this, noting this. Um, and there's a lot of people looking at this and trying to think about how to encourage more electric charging in the city. Zoning is not the biggest issue to it, but there have been situations where people have looked at the zoning rules and identified that it may be hard to um, put in a, like a large number of electric chargers, um, mainly because zoning rules were written thinking about fueling as like gasoline. And so they actually, zoning rules for parking actually limits the number of um, fuel pumps you're allowed to put in a parking facility. 
So this is the kind of thing that like, that's not at all the same thing, but there really aren't any rules in place to make it clear to people that these things are broadly permitted and should be broadly permitted. And then last on issues of um, wastewater and, and, and waste. Um, a great ex you today you are required to do to put street trees around new development. There have been situations where people have wanted to do something else where a street tree doesn't work for whatever technical reason around that site. Um, and D DOT and DEP look to include things like rain gardens as an option. The way the zoning was written a decade ago, the only option is street trees. And this is something where we'd like to actually give people some more opportunities to do more of the type of infrastructure that DEP and DET, DOT are now looking at around city streets to just make sure that, again, like zoning is updated to the most important things that we're trying to do as a city. So that, um, that's a very quick overview, trying to just hit some of the major points. Um, we are looking to begin public review starting in April. Um, so this is one of the reasons we wanted to come in earlier, just to be able to spend a little bit of time on some of the bigger sort of concepts and issues um, so that when we come back a few months from now, you know, we can spend more details, more, more time on the specific details of the proposal at that point. So any questions anyone has? Great. Thank you very much, Frank. And uh, I see questions coming in from uh, Commissioners Benjamin and Rampershad. And I'm sure there'll be others. Uh, Cerullo, okay. Um, and I do want to note that we are joined uh, now by Commissioner Goodridge, welcome, and Commissioner Crowell on Zoom. Uh, and uh, we appreciate, uh, Frank, your introduction to the topic. And as we noted at the top, this is one of three proposals that we are advancing. The first, uh, as Frank noted, will go to the council in a couple of months. And the next will be uh, the proposal for economic opportunity, which will follow several months later. And then the third uh, will be the one for housing opportunity, which will follow a number of months after that. Uh, so there's no shortage of work and aspiration for uh, the department as it relates to advancing these proposals. Uh, but we wanted to start the ball rolling here uh, in talking about the details of this one first, since it is coming down the pike first. So with that, Commissioner Benjamin, why don't you kick us off? Thank you, Frank. That was a great presentation. Uh, it was so good that now I have a bunch of questions. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> the first one is, I know even in my own building, I, I think you're going to have to talk about how in terms of building upgrades and retrogrades, how this is going to be paid for. Yeah. Because very few people are going to be very positive when they – under the city council's law from 2010, I think, um, where you have to do a survey every mm -hmm. three years, two years, uh, and it comes back as quite expensive to do anything. And if you're a single landlord of a small building or if you're a co-op that was a 421A or a J-51 with middle-class people in it and you're presented with this bill, right. people have no way to pay for it, so they're going to oppose it. So I, I think, so you're talking, one of the things I think you're talking about is like Local Law 97, which requires, I think it's buildings over 25,000 square feet to um, begin to meet uh, sort of en energy standards. Um, and if they don't, over time, meet those standards, fines begin to be put in place. So one of the things that, like, when we try to, when we're talking about this, we tend to focus on first on the zoning, but we often do point out, and one of the things I think as we're talking to communities just generally, are the possible funding sources that are out there and that have been increasing even like in the last year or two, that begin to um, make some of these things a bit more possible. Um, as a member of a condo board. Um, Seeing, personally seeing some of the costs that it could take to like do some of these retrofits can be um, scary. And so funding is definitely something we've heard so far. And we've been working with the Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice um, to just make sure that we have the best sense of those things and we can talk to people about those things um, as part of this. I think if you're going to present it to communities and to advocacy groups, you really need to have that up front because 
even in my own building, in trying to finance some of these things, we can't. Um, and the maintenance, if we were able to refinance to include these costs, the maintenance would mean that people would have to move out because they can't afford it. We, yeah, we definitely have heard these things and understand these. The other thing I think I'd say is just one of the things that we've noticed is like even if all of those things were in place, all of the you know, financing was found, there weren't all those issues, there are situations where even when people get to the end of that line and run into zoning, and I think one of the things that we want to try to do is we, in zoning, can't really fix these things. We can make sure that we understand the resources, make sure that we provide information about those things, but we can address the zoning that when, if and when those issues are addressed, still becomes an impediment for people. Um, so I definitely right. hear you. And I appreciate sure. that, but it is kind of the cart before the horse. If people can't, I understand the zoning issues, but I also understand if people can't see a way clear to getting over the first two hurdles, they're not going to get to the zoning issue. That's understandable. I, I agree. Um, my second issue was um, design. Sure. In, in, and priority order. In one of the slides, you were talking about the different uses on roofs. Mm -hmm. uh, does the department intend to prioritize which uses are more important? Otherwise, you may be encouraging taking away a resource that people use, like a garden or an outdoor recreational area, in order to more privatize the roof with solar panels. So, so, so one of the things I, I would say is that actually there's a recent um, city council bill that got approved, and it requires new buildings to um, it has essentially two options. You either have solar panels on your roof, or essentially it becomes a green roof and leaves those options open because they're different types of buildings and different types of situations. I think we've been taking as a sort of initially looking at this as following that lead and because there are so many different types of buildings and the situation of that individual building may be different. And so again, like not trying to prescribe those things because every situation is going to be its own, but trying to at least make sure that both are possible and on the rate on the sort of green roof, you can do that. But if you did want to do a solar panel, sometimes you can do it. Sometimes you can't. And I think that's the thing where at least from a, what sh should the zoning be the thing stopping you? Um, when the reasons it's stopping you is not anyone's, there wasn't a reason. It just was the way they was, was done. That's what we think we can address here and trying to give people the opportunities to figure out what exactly they want to do beyond that. And I understand the zoning is addressing new buildings, but in terms of exit, most of, since it was clear that most of the carbon output is, ex is from existing one. buildings. So trying to retrofit those or have people make them more energy efficient, they are going to try and do things like put solar panels on and is there a way that zoning can address either with design guidelines or a priority for rooftops, existing rooftops, that would give guidance to people um, as to what's possible for them? I mean, recently we had a building um, that put solar panels on top, and it entirely blocks sunlight from the gardens of people on the other side of the street. Mm. So there's trade-offs then. How, how can we use zoning and planning as a tool to try and make people understand what our priorities are? I hear that. that that's, that's a good thing for us to take back and think about too. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rappershad. Yes, uh, thank you, Frank. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, just a couple observations or comments. You know, I work in the field where we file a lot of dollar jobs with the building department. You get it, you see the most outrageous objections sometimes. Sometimes they make sense. Sometimes they don't. 
on slide eight, when you show the solar panels and you were discussing about possibly trying to get 100% coverage, the main issue that's going to come up is going to be FDNY access. They always want that six-foot clear path. They want it, There's a height restriction on it. Yep. Is the agency, I'm sure you guys are talking about FDNY, will the code be modified, section 903 of the building code, to address that in terms of if we're going to allow, if you want 100% coverage, then how is that, how are they going to work together in terms of? I think one thing, the way, when we talk to the fire department, that's a good example of it. Like zoning is really establishing in this instance, like the maximum. And then very, very much you're going to have to get approval of the Department of Buildings, the FDNY for that installation. And so that's a great example where like limiting it in zoning to some number is really problem is problematic because there's a million different buildings with all these different conditions and FDNY in some instances may be fine with 100 percent if it's a low building relatively small if it's a larger building or taller they're going to want different things and so given that those things are really dependent on the on the FDNY and their needs for that building and the specifics of that building that is something that like we are not going to change but we want to make sure that like People, even like there have been situations where FDNY was okay with a thing, but the zoning was actually the thing that was inhibiting it. And so that's the thing where we can address that. And we're trying to address that. Um, and the FDNY has identified a number of safety needs that we want to make sure that they can keep doing as the safety agency. Uh, one other question. In regards to the zoning resolution, you're going to look to modify, I guess, t sections 2312, which is permitted obstructions in open space and also in required yards to I – I don't know if you have any framework set up already in terms of the language that you're going to input. I, I thought you were going to quiz me on what was – No, 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 was not, not yet. Um, not yet. I, but, but before you answer that, real quick, with regards to the installation of the facade, we've actually seen it where they do talk about, oh, you're increasing the floor area, but not only that, they hit you with you're creating a non-compliant front yard which That's is right. another problem. And then you have to sometimes go get a reconsideration from one of the borough commissioners because the plan examiner won't remove it. <laughs> and you go for a second review, they deny you, and then you got to go up the chain. And as you know, after the commission, you go to technical affairs. Before you know it, you're three months in waiting to get a simple answer. So will, will the sections be modified to be clearly, I guess, so it's clear, so that way the examiners know. I, I think that is our goal. And, and I think what we've tried to do as we're thinking about this is um, in working with practitioners, but also DOB, who themselves sometimes feels like they're stuck by the rules that are just in place because we forgot to add something, you know, two decades ago or something to the text. And so we've been trying to make sure that, like, when we're thinking about addressing these things, we're doing it in all the correct places so that, you know, we address side yards, but don't forget about front yards, which is actually something that they've identified. There's some inconsistencies like that already. Um, so we're trying and, and working with them to um, make sure we get as many of them as possible. And just one last comment. Yeah, I think it would be great to reach out to both the AIA and yep. the engineers and you know, all the professional practitioners in terms of when you're doing the community outreach. And I think you'll get great feedback from them. <laughs> in terms of moving forward. Yeah, I mean, they've so. been great so far in helping us identify the kinds of issues that people are, like, like you are too, just like running into when they're trying to do these things. Right. So I think um, they've been supportive so far and, and actually quite helpful in just collecting the kinds of issues their members have seen. So. Thank you, Frank. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Cerullo. Thank you, Frank. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Um, so two questions sort of related to Commissioner Benjamin's line of questioning, and I, I won't ask the question, but I'll, I think the cost is obviously really important. And that, and that relates to both on residential buildings and also commercial buildings. I think it, it's and obviously a conversation that will have to take place. On the design, the, the design question, and this is likely very premature, but just to understand the thought process, um, in the section where we talked about the energy storage sure. on, on, on the roof, will do you foresee that there will be some, because I don't know what design storage, I mean, I don't know what storage will look like, right? And so the idea is what's going on the roof of a building and what is visible from 
the buildings that surround that building. Do we foresee that there will be some design standards involved in this or just the freedom to be able to use the roof for this purpose? Because I think it's a mistake if we don't tie them together in some way. Right. Um, we've all seen things that we could see from, you know, given the variety of heights of buildings around our city, there's always someone looking at the roof of someone else's building and what that looks like or what you could see um, is important, I think. And, and I just throw that out there as a, as a thought. Sure. I, I mean, it, it's a good thing. Actually, in some versions of these presentations, we give some more photos of these. Generally, they look like mechanical things. Sure. Uh, you know, so they're um, as, as batteries, um, large, of course. Um, so they'd be subject to the regulations for like all the other kinds of mechanical things that yeah. are on roofs. Um, in that roof example. Um, in a way, then, that's a little bit of what I'm afraid of, to be <laughs> uh, to be honest. I mean, it, <laughs> well, <laughs> Um, so I, I'm coming from that no, place, I actually, I, uh, that it's an opportunity to maybe lead what mechanicals look like down another road in terms of at least what surrounds mechanicals and what you could see, not to change the mechanicals at all. That's not what I'm suggesting, but sort of the aesthetic visual of how mechanicals and perhaps storage units sit on the roof of a building, it may be an opportunity to incorporate that into the discussion and God knows debate. So hmm. just point yeah, taken. Yeah. yeah, I think so. The, the one other very sort of um, quick question is how do we see how some of these ideas impact more historic buildings and architecturally unique um, and protected buildings, particularly the facade related issues. Right. And we have so many that we love and respect in our city. What, how do we tie programs like this into those buildings that will be obviously more difficult to do certain things with? Sure. So um, in our conversations with LPC, they note, and I think throughout this, we'll note that like if a building is in a historic district or if it's a landmark building itself, any of those changes that we'd be talking about here would have to be approved by LPC. All right. So that that is that becomes through that process that that's going to have to be thought through. One of the things that we've sort of started thinking about are like there are things that in the current zoning make it harder to, for example, replace or increase your insulation into the building. It's sort of a lot of it assumes that the facade is being replaced as a whole. And there may be situations where by making some changes now, we can make it easier for people who do have a historic property to make building retrofits because it doesn't automatically have to be about changing or significantly changing the facade, but it can actually be something that's happening be essentially behind the facade. Um, so there is, I think, some things that we're looking at, like in the specific details of this, that can help um, with 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 historic properties being able to be retrofitted. I, I hope, and, and I hope that part of this process attempts at least to come up with a plan for those buildings, particularly where LPC, which and I respect the role that LPC plays in all of this, but that there's some way that if the options provided for those buildings are being followed, there is some process that isn't the typical process so that timing-wise, there's a, a more, I don't want to use the word expedited, but but a more efficient process for those owners to be able to get to accomplish the goals of a program like this while not getting tied up in the bureaucracy that we know exists in in, in the world. So I think that's something we can come back with more info on. I know LPC has been looking at, at, at how they um, can support retrofitting of buildings. Sure. Uh, it's going to be, a, I can way. imagine it's a big issue, but I, I 
I think there's a way we should all be working together to keep it moving as opposed to it not moving. Thank you, Commissioner. We have Commissioner Dweck, followed by Vice Chair Knuckles, followed by Commissioner Osorio, followed by Commissioner Bozer. Uh, thank you, Frank. So it seems to me that most of the um, plan is geared towards removing impediments to the creation of uh, energy, renewable energy. Uh, what, what thought have we given to coupling it with a incentive for the creation of energy? And certainly it'll answer uh, Commissioner Benjamin's um, question regarding the cost prohibition to it. So uh, have there been a thought to for every, I, I, I want to say, I, I would say that if we said uh, for every square foot of solar panel, you get a certain amount of the zoning bonus, but um, that would be uh, not foolproofing it for the future, whatever technology uh, would come out. So I would say for every megawatt of power created through a renewable energy source, there is a uh, bonus in the zoning built in for you. So it might be a few square feet. And that would incent, incent uh, new uh, buildings that are going up to take advantage of it or defray the cost. Certainly when it comes to older buildings and the retrofitting of older buildings, what we could do is say, well, those, that zoning bonus that's generated can be um, sold in a marketplace within a mile of the project or two miles, some, 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 some similar to what we do with landmark uh, buildings that uh, have air rights that, that trade them in the, in the vicinity. Uh, and that would defray the cost to the existing buildings to implement these changes and certainly turbocharge this uh, um, program to create the energy that we we will need, especially with all the electric vehicles coming on board. We're just going to be eating a lot of electricity going forward. So what thought has the agency given to coupling it with a zoning incentive to really get this started the right way? I would say that one of the things on, on one of the slides, at least, was that was highlighting was that it, while most of it is trying to remove impediments, um, there are some incentives that exist in zoning today to sort of at, in 2012 for particularly put in place to try to kickstart a little bit more use of uh, uh, retrofitting buildings. And I think we're trying to think about what may be the more up to date generation or of that idea. Um, and how does that affect new and existing buildings um, uh, maybe more equally? If you look at the original incentive, it seems more focused on new buildings um, and has actually been used by a, a good number of new buildings, but it's not. It's had difficulties for existing ones. And if, to I think one of the points that's been made, like most of the buildings that need to retrofit are existing buildings. And so trying to make sure that zoning does, you know, is, is zoning putting its, weight on the scale appropriately for them. So that's something that we're, we don't have a specific answer right now, but it's something we're definitely looking at. So the, the bottom line is I believe that an incentive has to have a financial consequence in order for it to be used uh, by the developer or builder or owners of the current building, as you said, defraying the cost of, uh, imagine getting the uh, assessment on a retrofit. So, so it has to have some financial benefit. weight benefit to it and weight. Yeah, noted. Dude, definitely something that that's something worth trying to think about a bit. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Vice Chair Knuckles. Thank you, Frank. Good afternoon. Uh, in your last slide, you talked about the, um, I guess, linkage between storm water management and uh, reduction of CO. Could you just expand on that? Yeah, I mean, so amongst the things that um, in the four categories that the 85, 80 by 50 sort of city framework looks at. The fourth one is um, uh, waste and water, mm -hmm. um, just because of the sort of general costs of both of those and, and the carbon input, uh, footprint of both of those in the city. So for the most part, zoning doesn't really deal with those things. There are some places where, for example, like zoning requires hard pavement in some parking lots. And this is an example of something that, like, no one really thought about. They just wrote the rules in a certain way. And we can begin to clean out some of those issues that people have faced when they're trying to, like, in this instance, deal with stormwater, right? Because, like, if you have to build the pumps and the sewers and everything to account for stormwater because you have zoning issues that are actually making more runoff, that becomes a problem and causes more carbon to be generated. 
So these are, they're really in the scale of all the things that zoning addresses. This is pretty small, but it's definitely things that people have run into and we want to just try to address. So the other example is like rain gardens on streets. I think that's the one that's in the presentation. Um, if you want to do one of those, you run into issues because of the way that zoning works, it just assumes the option is a street tree. And so if you want to, if you have issues with a street tree um, and you want to do a rain garden, you don't really have a path for that. So that's another thing where that can help address stormwater, which helps possibly lower the amount of energy it takes to deal with stormwater and all pumping of all those things. And so that's a thing where we can, we can, we can do a little bit and we want to try. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman, Commissioner Osorio. Thanks so much, Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation and, and congratulations. This is this is really exciting. This is, I mean, <laughs> borderline historic. So this is really, really exciting. I, I also wanted to congratulate you. I was able to participate, well, listen in on one of the public sessions. And um, I recall at the end somebody saying that they wanted to learn more from the Department of City Planning on how to become a planner. I don't know if you <laughs> recall that one, but but that's, that speaks about a, a really exciting sort of discussion. So kudos on that. I had a quick, a couple questions. The first question is about the process. I was wondering if you can explain a little what the process moving forward is going to be. I specifically want to know if the City Planning Commission will be voting on these amendments before they go to the council. Yes, as, as zoning, as, as a citywide zoning text amendment, um, it goes to the community boards and our presidents for review, um, and then comes back to the commission. Uh, you have to vote on it before it can then go to the city council. So yes. And when would we see the actual amendment? Um, I think we, what we were saying before, looking to begin public review in April. Um, so that's really probably the first time um, to, I guess if you're looking for like the zoning text, that would be like the, that, that's where it would be part of the public conversation. Thank you. Again, really exciting and, and really looking forward and being useful in terms of, of framing that. I, I had a co another question regarding process, and I was wondering if you've consulted with the environmental justice movement on it. You know, they've been behind and actively framing uh, some of the legislation that you referenced, specifically the CLCPA. And, and the reason why I ask that in part has to do with uh, Commissioner Benjamin and Dweck's question, because in addition to having the amendments, I'm wondering what is the plan? What is the plan to really implement them and incentivize their implementation? Specifically, because this is also a historic time in which there are millions of dollars made available through the CLCPA from the state, but also from the federal government to subsidize these improvements in, in disadvantaged communities, which is sort of the term that the legislation has created. So, so I'm wondering if you can share a little bit, you know, going back to the previous questions, you know, can there be a plan led by the department to build on the text amendments, but also support uh, the implementation, attract these resources, et cetera? Um, to the first part of your question about talking to uh, the environmental justice community, yes, we have. And, and, and learning some of the things that, some of the issues that we are trying to address, I think, come directly from some of the things they've identified too. Um, I think the question of sort of how to, the, the plan to use the resources. I think that's a good thing for us to think about, and not just us at city planning, but the city family as a whole, um, just because there definitely are different aspects of this. But that's something that um, we want to, I, I, it, it, it's helpful to have this conversation today because I think it's like, yes, these are the technical zoning issues we're trying to address, but it, it's helpful to think about like how to, that, that second part of this is really so tied to this first part and trying to make sure that we do a good job with you all, but then also just as part of a public conversation with that. So it, thank you. Thank noted. you. I, I appreciate that. And, and would really encourage you to include some of those ideas when you return, because it would be great to see how we can advance on both fronts. I mean, not, not to, to take so much time, but as you're having conversations with the EJ movement, ask about what other cities in New York state are doing about this. For example, the city of Ithaca, has been experimenting on ways to engage the private sector in equitable and interesting ways, hmm. where they've created equity bonds to accelerate uh, investment in, in electrification, 
where the city and the, part, the private sector partner on actually sort of paying for this. So anyway, yeah, just, no, just another sort of like idea as you go back. And then just, just to finish up, I had a couple of questions about the, the, the other day we had a really cool presentation from the Department of City Planning on uh, principles of urban design. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, you know, in addition to reducing some of these impediments, to what extent are you actually providing guidance on how they should be done? Um, specifically, you know, we've seen, we've had several conversations about the electric chargers, but with no real guidance from the city in terms of, you know, how should these spaces look like when it comes to public access? Where should they be located? Mm -hmm. Not just sort of like, do you have the plug or not? So I'm wondering if, if there's room for some of this in, in terms of what's ahead. Um, it's a good thing for us. I, I, it's a good thing for us to think about more. Okay. Yeah. And the other thing is that you mentioned solar, wind, uh, but you didn't really expand on or, or mention geothermal. And I was wondering if, if was there an analysis on that? What were your, your findings in that regard? So far, and this is a great question to ask you too. Um, so far, when we've brought it out, because it is part of the mix, um, from a zoning perspective, is it a thing that people have run into zoning issues in addressing? Um, we haven't seen any. So, you know, it, it, it can happen in the building. It's not something that, like, seems to require special zoning to have happen, um, unlike some of these other aspects, which usually are outside or need to be separated out. Um, so that's been our experience so far, and, and from talking to people, because it's definitely something that's, like, part of the mix of future, of the city's future energy, um, energy budget, I guess. But, like, it's not been a zoning thing that anyone has, come to us, and, and when we've tried to think about it and research it too, we really haven't seen the, the thing. That's the problem, whereas with many of these other things, we can identify dozens. I, I encourage you to think about whether there, in this particular case, on the other hand, there may be some additional considerations that could incentivize the use, because we also haven't seen many applications that include it. And yeah. you know, we think it's a, or I, I think it's a missed opportunity. I, I have one, one last question, which is, in terms of this, and then no comment. The it sounds like I maybe I missed it, but are there any um, provisions that disincentivize automobile use? So, at least with this proposal, one of the well, and this is actually a, a great maybe segue to the fact that, as Dan noted before, there's a number of other citywide text amendments. Um, what this is trying to do is is be a, sort of focused on just the specifics of, of really kind of zoning impediments to um, energy transition. As we move through some of those other projects, parking is definitely a thing that we're spending a lot of time thinking about. Um, and a lot of that speaks to like the time frames of them. It, parking is a bit complicated issue, requires a lot of public discussion, a lot of environmental review in a way that we'll, we're thinking about where does that best fit within the various text amendments we're talking about, um, and in a way trying to keep this one pretty focused on the issues that we're trying to, but we know that that is such an important aspect of sort of decarbonization, but it's something that I think we're trying to handle in one of the projects you'll be seeing in the next couple <laughs> weeks um, oh, as okay. part of this. Thank you. I appreciate that. Is yeah. that it's, it's, I think that this is a moment where the city could be sending a really strong signal in terms of, you know, what should we be looking for? Right. In other words, you know, even one thing is private applications, but even proposals that we've seen here coming from the city uh, propose building unrequired parking lots that I think, you know, should basically follow the, the, the type of uh, transformation that you're, that you're talking about. And, and maybe one last thing is, along those lines, it's clear that the text amendments are focused on mitigation, but I wouldn't disconnect them from adaptation and really make sure that what you're doing here is both providing guidelines on, on how to advance electrification in the light of what needs to happen in places where there's such a vulnerability for flooding and other climate-related events so that we can use or activate the zoning text amendments in that regard as well. Otherwise, you know, you're just going halfway through. Noted. I, I think that's something that just after I had say last year, but just that's something that we're thinking about and trying to think about are there things that we can do in this or can we do in some of the other text proposals to, to address, but it's, it's definitely on our minds. Thanks and for your answers and congrats again. Thank you, Commissioner.
Um, let's go to Commissioner Bozorg uh, to be followed by Commissioner Gold. Hey, Frank, thanks hey. so much. Um, I agree, this is very exciting. Uh, my first question um, is very similar to Commissioner Osorio's question about environmental justice, but I was just curious, you know, beyond talking to the environmental justice movement, what are some of the ways that kind of racial equity issues, environmental issues have been considered as you're developing these text amendments? Um, what's kind of the overlay? And are there other agency partners kind of helping you all think about that, whether it's the subsidy agencies, assuming subsidies may come into play at some point for the buildings? Or housing, or even just regulatory yeah. for yeah. some of these too. Yeah, I mean, like I, you know, an example that actually comes to mind quick, so I don't is like peaker plants, right? So peaker plants are like a major issue that um, uh, Peak Coalition looks at trying to um, address because they're generally located in places where they have a major effect on mm -hmm. communities. Um, moving to a energy system that is more solar and battery storage related can remove the need for peaker plants. And so one of the reasons why I think we'd want to be as, from a zoning perspective, be permissive of that energy storage and energy production in the city itself is to address the very, that exact issue that they have been raising and pointing out as like a major problem. So I think it's, it, in it, it, it's sort of one of those things that the more we hear, we sort of try to get that blended into the project. Um, it, or the more things like that that we hear that we know zoning, you know, is actually becoming an impediment to doing, that's something, that's a good example of, like, us trying to, like, expand the proposal or address the situations that they're raising. Kind of um, and then to just that, I, I think the question of, like, financing and, and sort of thinking about that, like, it is a, I think it's part of the, it's a question for us as like this, the whole city family and the various agencies that do this work and trying to think about how to like both, to some degree, it feels like describe even the things that are out there, like to the point about like, yes, there is actually a lot of federal funding now and the state is actually has funding too, but then also thinking about like, what is, you know, beyond that, like, is there some broader plan? So I think that's a good thing for us right. to take back. Right. Yeah, I think to the as much as the department can acknowledge and then try to account for the different experiences of yeah. the, the way environmental justice has been experienced unequally across the city is great. Um, the second question I have is, um, you know, we often when when hearing about text amendments and being briefed on them, hear the phrase "we're trying to clean up for past things we did not intend or could not anticipate." Um, so I'm just curious, kind of as director yeah. of zoning, this is a little bit more philosophical question, but how did, how do you approach kind of, as for now, you have this opportunity to do another text amendment, how do you approach trying to think about the flexibilities that need to be employed now to try to anticipate an unintended consequence that you may not have anticipated today? Or <laughs> So <laughs> obviously you can't anticipate it, but how are you thinking about that that is kind of a perennial issue in planning that we're often trying to correct for um, past unintended, or sometimes they were intended, but sometimes uh, past consequence or consequences of our actions. So there'll always be a zoning division just because of this. Um, no, I, I mean I think you know, and we use that term, but I think it, it is interesting because like sometimes it is just you wrote it in a way that you didn't even think about this situation. That happens sometimes. You also have situations where the concept, the very concept never existed. And so you try to write, I, I think our general, the general way we try to address these things is to try to be, and there's always tension in this, but like you try to be as open and flexible as possible and not get really specific on like this exact thing is what we're trying to make happen because inevitably a different situation with different technology, with different people involved will raise all of the issues that come up. And I think Zone Green, like, is a great example of, like, they were doing, they did a lot of amazing things as part of that project. On the edges, there were things that, like, now people look at and realize, oh, that didn't, you know, yes, you allowed solar panels, but you forgot about this part of this. And so there's always, in, to some degree, we try to make sure we address as many of those as possible. Um, but one of the great things about the zoning resolution is you can change it, and that we should change it when we realize there are issues. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Commissioner Gold on Zoom to be followed by Commissioner Kermani, and then Benjamin. Thank, 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Frank, I agree. Um, terrific presentation. It's great to see um, how we're thinking about this. I had um, a broader question. As you've put this together in these issues, you know, a, a similar but slightly different uh, follow up uh, to Commissioner Bozark, <laughs> which is have we had the conversation, the folks who are running into these issues and the retrofits, presumably uh, many of them are, you know, some of the developers out there or some of the, you know, the real estate owners, whether large or small or whatnot. Um, you know, some of these seem to be patently obvious and make good sense, but have we had, have we done the community outreach that we like to do to uh, the people who are running into this right now to find out what else we should be dealing with? You know, I think we we try to do that, and we've tried to do that as part of this project. And so, uh, you know, talking to I think Raj, you brought it up. The AIA is, is a good example of that because they can sort of collect their body, their their members' information. Groups like the Urban Green Council actually is a great repository because they can sort of connect with the sort of various um, people at different firms and different places that think about these things and also have experienced all different issues. And so I think we've tried to find as many as we can. And, you know, it, it becomes a situation where someone remembers a thing they heard about and we do try to run it down, finding the architects who ran into the situation to make sure we understand it. So it's definitely, it's sort of an aspect of this that like, we don't show much, but it definitely is, is part of it. And I think, you know, we try to, you know, we talk to anybody we can on this. Um, and I think, um, you know, if anyone has suggestions of groups or, or people even to talk to, we would definitely be up for it, um, just to make sure we have the best full story of this as we can. Yeah, I mean, I wonder on that side, if if we haven't, if um, there are areas of revenue, perhaps, um, that we should be reaching out to. Because, you know, as I say, I'm, I'm a big proponent of, you know, speaking to the community, but um, as we look at the issues that you're raising, many of these are issues that, you know, are not um, the one-offs by, you know, homeowners. These are um, larger, you know, either operators or building the folks that we want to encourage to, to upgrade, um, you know, their services running into these issues are, you know, sound to be perhaps some of the larger building owners. So, I mean, I, I do think I know as I say, it might not be in our normal course, but I do, you know, I, I, I would, uh, I want to, I want to think about that a little bit more and see if there are spots to help you, but certainly, um, we do want to go, you know, a little more broadly, um, to, to get the insight because the work you're doing is really important if we want to get people there on, on the greenhouse side, but, um, it's also, you know, Im important to get the real, you know, time on the ground feedback of, of what actually is, you know, is complicating things at this point. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I definitely would um, recommend as much of that um, as we can do as possible. Um, and, you know, the second thing I just wanted to mention is I think I would also echo um, the comment of, of uh, Commissioner Cerullo on making sure that we're working closely with our partners and landmarks because, um, you know, as, as he correctly pointed out, some of these issues um, are for the public good, uh, for sure, and they're better for all of us, but there are some impediments perhaps there that maybe, you know, together we can solve. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Kermani. Thank you. Nice to meet you. And uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I just want to mention NYCHA and public housing. And, and I know it's not easy often to coordinate or you can't because of federal stuff. And uh, But I think just to double down on what many commissioners have said, Commissioner Benjamin, Commissioner Bozorg, Commissioner Osario, and thinking about the environmental justice and equity implications and economic equity, racial justice and equity, and vulnerable communities that are vulnerable because of environmental issues, like we saw in Red Hook and what went on in public housing there, and also the opportunity in communities where um, many of the ideas that you presented, which I think are, as Commissioner Osorio said, actually historic and would be amazing, that there are so many ways that energy conservation could save so much money for NYCHA, the agency we know, um, and are very urgent. And that NYCHA has been trying to do and engaging in many different ways, whether it's Green City Force and their 
as an organization and working with young public housing residents on how to do this kind of work or thinking with block power about how do we do so just curious and we know that and and keeping this totally politically neutral we know that rad and pact are happening so there there's new development happening on public housing grounds and so i guess my question if there is one which would be like shocking given how much i'm just like talking is um how how is it or would it be to um, like, how would this affect what happens at NYCHA, or does it not, or how? I, you know, I, I, it, it's, I don't, it, the slide when we show the solar panels, just to give an example of it, um, in early versions of the PowerPoint, it was a NYCHA campus, because they were the yeah. ones who actually pointed out the issue to us first. Mm. Um, and so, where they were the ones who were trying to put solar panels on all of their roofs in the red yep. houses, actually, too. Yep. Um, so, you know, if we make zoning changes, NYCHA could benefit from those sure. zoning changes. And to be fair, we've benefited from their experiences yeah. trying to do these things on their on the campuses. Yeah. Um, so it, it's it's definitely been part of this as we've yeah. been thinking about it. And I think, too, and, and a couple of commissioners have pointed it out, that there's, you know, this even demonstration of alignment issue between city, state, and Fed. And certainly public housing gets caught up in all three of those and the importance of like the narrative of what New York City is is doing and how that can kind of strengthen the narrative of why it's important to invest in public housing, which I think is just lost all the time, all over the all over the country. And we know that um there's a t ton of public housing in New York City. I mean, it's often the most seen yet unseen infrastructure. And I think that a narrative really helps um, elevate why the value and why it's important to value investing in public housing. So just thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, let me just go back briefly to Commissioners Benjamin and Osorio and Rampershad, and I think we should move to a close on this because we do have a lot uh, on our agenda today, but let's uh, go for it. Two quick questions. The first one was one of the other commissioners spoke about looking at allowable uses in yards. Yeah. Um, uh, yes. But uh, a number of years ago, we changed some of the mechanical space rules to allow for more space in emergency exits, et cetera. Is it, are you looking at expanding the mechanical space, well, allowing more things to be considered mechanical space and fitting into that exempt, exemption from the FAR? Well, it, it, it's two things. It's FAR, and then it's also like where can that itself be located? Right. Um, and so different in different parts of the city, like the floodplain has different rules that are more permissive than other parts of the city, that sort of different in different parts of the, different things. One of the things we're trying to do is just, first of all, like understand like <laughs> what applies where and is there any coherency that we should be thinking about, like maybe to use the phrase of cleaning some of this up, like trying to provide more consistent rules that also maybe not only just are consistent, but also kind of address these things more specifically. Mm -hmm. That like people just run into issues of not even knowing if they can do a thing and that takes, you know. And you have those people who are also are opposed to the percentage mechanical space that is now being allowed. Um, but the yeah. second question is, goes back to the finances. I was wondering how you're working with Con Ed and DASNY and um, Brooklyn Union Gas or whatever they're called now. Um, mm -hmm. Because one of the things that happens in any infrastructure is that if you use less, if there is capacity, if you use less than the capacity, you pay a surcharge because they still have the capacity. So they split the unused capacity up among the u users. So you pay for it because they have the capacity. Um, it's certainly the same thing at DEP where I worked in wastewater. The capacity is there. You're going to pay for it. So how are you working with Con Ed and all of those? If we are really talking about in 2050 having this significant reduction, 
in fossil fuels and in their products, so to speak, are we just going to be paying for it anyway? Um, we've been working a lot with them to understand what they are doing, what they're trying to do, what they're running into is issues, what they're, what they're trying to do. Like one of the things is by the city and the state having specific goals now for these things. Um, they're the ones, uh, Con Ed is a good example of like, they're charged with making that happen. And so we've been spending a lot of time with them to understand what, you know, what are the things that they're running into and are there things that like the city and zoning particularly um, may be becoming the problem, you know, and are there situations where zoning is the thing or is there situations where it's other things? And so the city, it's not just us trying to talk with Con Ed, um, but just the city family as a whole on these things. So I, to the specific, it, it's in your specific question of payment and stuff like that, I will assure you I'm not the expert on it, but it's a good thing to like make sure like we have a good answer for, but it's definitely been part, you know, this is something that like, you know, we want to make sure that Con Ed and Con Ed can meet the state's goals and that zoning is not the thing keeping all that stuff from happening. Um, I think since we have the whole city of yes, that it's important that we address that question and make sure that we're not in that world of unintended yep. consequences of which you spoke, that we're not creating an unintended consequence, which is that a building spends X amount to retrofit and then gets the same bill because they're not using the electricity that is provided for them. We'll look into it more. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Osorio, and we're going to have uh, Commissioner Rabershad finish this up. So. Thank you, Chair. Just a quick clarification question. I, I was really excited with your response to Commissioner Bozorg's question, and I was wondering if, if you can clarify whether the city is actually endorsing the recommendations of the Peaker Plant Coalition, and if there's anything <laughs> going to be reflected on the amendments. That sounded really I, I will say that the city, that, the, that we note that zoning may be an impediment to getting there. I don't, I, I don't, I'm not going to be the one to Gotcha, 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 gotcha. Maybe if, if you can share, building on your previous response, if you can share any of the examples of things that you learned from the environmental justice movement that you've reflected, maybe by, by email later, that would be really exciting. Okay. Um, thank yeah, you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rappershed. Just one clarification. With regards to the rain garden option, are you suggesting that instead of using a street tree, you can put a rain garden? And and if that's the case, because the way the street tree works is when you file, you got to do an SD1 form, you pay into the tree fund, so you pay parks. So if they go over the option of doing a rain garden, do that, does that mean they have to pay DEP any kind of fee? Is that the, something that you guys have thought about? I know it's a little bit... Yeah, I mean, I, I think what we've line, been, right? the way that we've been thinking about it is, so if you look at the, the street tree manual has over time expanded to be inclusive of things well beyond street trees. The zoning resolution still talks about street trees. And so an idea that we've been work, looking at and trying to make sure could happen is, say you can't do the street tree, can you have the option that says, well, somewhere on that is you can do the rain garden, which is also still part of the street tree manual, um, and, and, and comply with the zoning rule. Um, so it, it's, it's more of a trying to just make sure that essentially that the zoning kept up with where the rest of the city family was. Great. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, we appreciate your time and attention to this and also the whole team that has been working on this uh, proposal. Yeah, let's do it. I think uh, Commissioner Osorio said it best when he said it was almost historic, nearly historic, <laughs> historic adjacent. I don't know what he said exactly, but I agree with him completely. Maybe even historic. We appreciate um, all of the work that's going into this and we look forward to coming back to the commission to talk about this further uh, and these comments that were raised today are extremely helpful. Um, and a lot of them relate, frankly, to how do you operationalize the, you know, the changes that we are attempting to make possible here. And so uh, we should think about how, uh, how best to address that as we uh, um, put forth this important proposal. So thanks very much, Frank. To Thank, everybody. You Thank you all. Okay. Ryan. Uh, we now have a presentation on the Melrose Parkside Historic District uh, from the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Kate will kick us off here. Great. Good afternoon. 
Good afternoon, Chair Grodnick and Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to present the Melrose Parkside Historic District, which was designated on December 13th of last year. I'm joined by my colleague, Timothy Fry, Director of Special Projects and Strategic Planning. And I'm the Director of Research for the Landmarks Preservation Commission. The Melrose Parkside Historic District is a cohesive group of 38 architecturally significant single and two family houses designed by two of Brooklyn's most uh, prolific architects, Benjamin Driesler and Axel Hedman. They were all built between 1909 and 1915. The district has a small sense of place from its intact historic character and contains likely the largest and most distinctive collection of a type of house unique to Brooklyn, known as the Kinko House. The designation helps further LPC's goal of equitable designations through the five boroughs that protect significant architectural character and highlight the city's diversity. And we've had great support for the district. Um, the historic district is located on Parkside Avenue between Flatbush and Bedford Avenues in the Flatbush uh, neighborhood of Brooklyn. It was identified through surveys and in response to requests from property owners to evaluate it, which were accompanied by a petition and many letters of support. LPC staff reviewed it both on its own and within the broader study of the neighborhood and found that it stands out for its high intact architectural quality and historic character. Staff also found that the remainder of the block and the surrounding um, adjacent blocks contained buildings of lesser architectural quality and integrity in a variety of scales, which did not contribute to a strong sense of place. So the boundary, as you see here, um, is very tight and just includes the historic row houses. Um, outreach and engagement with property owners began before the pandemic um, and continued uh, through many conversations. We had two virtual property owner meetings in 2021 and 22 uh, to explain what designation means and to build understanding of our process, how to work with LPC and also support for the district. We heard substantial support at our public hearing in October last year and in letters, um, including from some lifelong residents. We also heard from some people who were concerned about regulation and, and opposed designation, um, all of which is included in the public record and the designation report. All right, briefly some history. The name Melrose Parkside reflects the early history of the block, once mapped as Robinson Street where an 18th century manor house called Melrose Hall became the namesake for a planned suburban development in the 19th century. This ultimately was unrealized and the property was sold to a developer, William Brown, uh, whose son began developing single and two family houses here in the early 20th century. William Arthur Alexander Brown petitioned the city to rename the street Parkside Avenue in connection to Prospect Park and Ocean Parkway and began building rows of duplex houses by 1909. Uh, these are complete by 1910. He then built a row of single family homes um, by 1913. And then the last homes were built by 1915. The dominant house type within the district is the two family duplex, a type of row house apparently unique to Brooklyn and popular between 1905 and 1915. The Kings and Westchester Land Company first developed houses of this type in 1905 and began to market them as King Co houses. They were intended as an alternative to the conventional two family house of the late 19th century, which appeared indistinguishable from single family brownstones. Designed to offer greater privacy, each house here of this type had two totally separate two story apartments, each with its own private entrance. Envisioning Parkside Avenue as an exclusive neighborhood of elegant duplex homes, Brown began his project at the peak of the duplex's popularity. That year, a Brooklyn Eagle article um, called them, quote, the latest type of modern house building with artistic and varied fronts of fine architectural design. Brown marketed his new duplex houses on Parkside Avenue as the most perfect houses ever built for two families yet with the privacy of a one-family house. Um, the two rows of these houses in the district are the largest 
and most distinctive collection of the type that we know of in the city. And you can see them here on either side of the street. The architect Benjamin Driesler, whose work is found in several Brooklyn historic districts, composed six distinct alternating designs to create what were noted um, in an advertisement as the most artistic fronts of greater New York. The houses feature two entrances on the first story, facades designed in the classical vocabulary with an assortment of projecting bays, and mansard roofs punctuated by dormers in a variety of configurations. And you can see here um, rooftop bulkheads, and those are original. They are intended to allow the people on the top apartment access to the roof, while the people below had access to the garden. Um, as interest in the duplex type declined, in 1912, Brown again turned to architect Benjamin Driesler, and he designed a row of eight single-family houses, which he marketed as, quote, easy housekeeping, no basement houses. With deep open areaways, the row features full with terraces and shorter stoops and a variety of classically inspired design features. And the last row, um, in 1913, after Brown retired for real estate to concentrate on his brewery business, Eli H. Bishop and Son purchased um, the undeveloped parcel on the north side, designed in the neoclassical style by Axel Hedman. Um, these are called American Basement Plan, single family houses, and again are done in the classical um, vocabulary. Early residents of the row houses and duplexes on Parkside Avenue through about 1950 were white and predominantly born in the United States um, and included households headed by doctors, engineers, teachers, businessmen, artists, and musicians. By the mid 20th century, Flatbush saw a large increase in African American and Afro Caribbean residents as black families moved into the area. Central Brooklyn soon became the center of the city's Afro Caribbean community and by the 1980s was a major destination for immigrants from Caribbean countries. Today, this vibrant block of Parkside Avenue continues to reflect the diversity of Greater Flatbush. The Block Association is active, and the community's excellent stewardship of the buildings contributes to its special character. With its distinctive variety of row houses, united by their classically inspired design elements and uniformly deep front areaways, the district as a highly intact historic character and sense of place. Uh, the commission voted unanimously to designate the district and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, before I go to Vice Chair Knuckles, Knuckles, let me just uh, ask one general question about the neighborhood or uh, whether there are any significant projects, capital or otherwise, that are going on in the, uh, in the surrounding area that might affect one's consideration of all of this? Well, the community did come to us um, voicing concern about development. I don't know of a, of a single um, large-scale project going on around it, though. Private or public? Yeah. Okay. Vice Chair Knuckles. Thank you, Chair. Uh, you just enunciated the scope <laughs> of our review. Uh, and, uh, no accident there. Right. <laughs> it's, and it's not to weigh in on the appropriateness of, of any designation. But given the distinction of uh, architectural distinction here, I'm just curious as to why it's taken so long. To, uh, well, that's a question we get sometimes. Um, but it is we're, we are always working throughout the city to designate buildings and districts as equitably as we can. Um, and this is an area that does have other nearby districts. Uh, it is something we've been aware of for some time and um, was identified at the time when we designated the much larger Prospect Lefferts Historic District. Um, and so we're delighted to have done it now. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Okay. Um, thank you very much. We appreciate uh, your being here. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ryan, what's up next? So the first item on our agenda is a pre-hearing review of the historic district designation here in Brooklyn Community District 9. And our presenter is Anif Yazdi. Uh, he's presenting for the first time as a uh, full-time employee. At this is Plan. for 7120 New Utrecht? 
No, this is the Melrose Park Act side. Oh, now history. we're hearing the, yeah, the presentation on the Okay, I see. Okay, we'll got keep it. it short. Now we're actually going to go into the land use question. Go ahead. Indeed. Thank you very much, and uh, good to be here. So, good afternoon, uh, Chair Gorodnik and Commissioners. Today I'll be presenting an application by the Landmarks Preservation Commission to designate the Melrose Parkside Historic District located within the Prospect Lefferts Gardens neighborhood of Brooklyn in Community District 9. Word about the surrounding area. The immediate surrounding area is primarily low to mid-density residential buildings with commercial uses concentrated on the avenues. The Flatbush Avenue Regional Commercial Shopping Corridor lies immediately one block west of the historic district, and the Prospect Lefferts Garden Historic District with detached one and two family homes is located three blocks to the north. The district is well served by public transportation. The Parkside Avenue Q train stop is one block to the west, and the Winthrop Street Station running two and five trains is two blocks to the east. The MTA's B-12 local bus runs east and west toward Broadway Junction, the B-49 running north and south along Ocean Avenue, and the B-41 running from downtown Brooklyn to Kings Plaza along Flatbush Avenue also serves residents in the area. The proposed historic district encompasses, like our colleagues mentioned, 38 properties and is comprised of those duplex, no basement, and American basement style homes located along Parkside Avenue between Flatbush Avenue to the west and Bedford Avenue to the east. The historic district is located within an R6 non-contextual district. R6 allows for housing to be developed under height factor and quality housing regulations. The surrounding area also consists of some R71 non-contextual as well as R6B and R7A contextual zoning districts. As you may know, uh, these were mapped in 2009 as part of the Flatbush Avenue rezoning. The contextual districts uh, regulate the height and bulk of new buildings to produce buildings that are consistent with the existing neighborhood character. There are a few commercial overlays nearby. They're mapped along Flatbush and Rogers Avenues, they're C1 and C2 districts, um, and they're mapped within residential districts along streets that serve local retail needs. So typically in these areas, we'll see uh, neighborhood grocery stores, restaurants, and some beauty parlors. To round us out, I'll reaffirm that the Department of City Planning does not have any knowledge of any conflict with the zoning resolution, projected public improvements, or any plans for development, growth, improvement, or renewal with respect to lots within the historic district. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Commissioner Buzzard. Do we know how much new housing at all? I know there, it's it's clear that the Department has not found any conflicts with existing or planned projects, but do we know how much new housing has been built in this community board over the past decade? I don't have information precisely about the community board numbers, or I can circle up with that information, but between 2010 and 2020, uh, I believe there's been about 2,000 units of new housing built uh, within a quarter mile of Melrose Parkside Historic District. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, thank you very much. And this will go to a public hearing on uh, Wednesday, February the 1st. So we will be uh, uh, hearing from anybody who wishes to, to be heard on this subject then. Thank you. Take Great. care. Thank you. And now I believe we're on yeah. to 7120 New so Utrecht second, Avenue, Ryan. That's right. This is the second item on our agenda. It's a certification of a zoning map and zoning tax amendment in Brooklyn Community District 11 mm -hmm. and presenting for the first time to the commission is Lucia Marquez Reagan. All right, Lucia, Thanks. welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Grodnick and commissioners. This is an application by 7120 New Utrecht LLC for a zoning map amendment and zoning text amendment to facilitate a mixed use development in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. The development will contain 100 units, 30 of which will be income restricted with ground floor commercial. The project area is in Bensonhurst, Community District 11, and is located at 7120 New Utrecht Avenue between 71st and 72nd Streets. New Utrecht Avenue is a primary commercial corridor in the neighborhood. The elevated D subway runs along New Utrecht Avenue. 
The project area includes the frontage of New Utrecht Avenue between 71st and 72nd, 71st to the north and 72nd to the south. 71st and 72nd streets are both 60 feet wide. The project area is at the intersection of New Utrecht Avenue and 16th Avenue, both 80 wide, uh, 80 foot wide streets. Lieutenant Joseph Patrocino Playground is located diagonally to the east of the project area. The project area is in an R5 C22 zoning district that has been in place since the 1960s. The immediate surrounding is also mapped with an R5 zoning district. R5 districts are non-contextual residential districts with an FAR of 1.25 and typically produce three to four story attached houses and small apartment buildings um, and have a height limit of 40 feet. An R4 district is map, mapped south of the project area, which typically produces single and two family homes at two to three stories. A C22 commercial overlay uh, that's allowed, that has allowed ground floor retail and residential districts when commercial overlays are mapped with R1 and through R5 districts as it is in the project area, the maximum commercial floor area is 1.0. The current uses of the surrounding area include residential and commercial. Residential uses as seen on this map in yellow, largely on the narrow streets comprise of two story, one to two family attached and detached homes and two to three story attached row houses along the side streets, as well as two to three story mixed use buildings found along the avenues Institutional uses uh, are in the surrounding area are seen in blue and include PS 112 Lefferts Park Elementary School located on the west end of the same block as the project area. Just south of PS 112 are more community facility and institutional use with Our Lady Guadalupe Roman Catholic Church and the Polish School of Education as well as Lefferts Park Annex, a continuation of 112, PS 112. An industrial use in light purple is the 75-foot Verizon utility building across from the project area to the east. The area is well served by public transit. The D train 71st Street station has an entrance in front of the project area on the corner of New Utrecht and 71st Street. The B8 bus runs along 18th Avenue, two blocks to the east, with service between Diker Heights and East Flatbush, and B the B4 bus runs along Bay Ridge Parkway, three blocks to the south with service between Bay Ridge and Sheepshead Bay. The project area is within a transit and fresh zone. In this view, we're facing north on the corner of 72nd and New Utrecht Avenue. The development site outlined here in yellow is lot 33, a former drive-through bank, a vacant former drive-through bank. Moving north along New Utrecht, this is a view of the development site on New Utrecht Avenue facing southwest towards 72nd Street. It contains lot 33, the bank, lot 31, the accessory parking lot to the former bank, which we'll see in greater detail in the next slide. This view of the project area along New Utrecht is facing northwest towards 71st Street and pictures more of lot 31, the accessory parking, as well as lot 29, a corner building. This image is a view of, uh, also a view facing northwest along New Utrecht Avenue. The project area um, also includes lot 29, the building on the corner of New Utrecht and 71st. Visible uh, is the 71st Station D entrance. We're now facing the project area on the intersection of New Utrecht Avenue and 71st Street facing southwest. Pictured is the corner lot 29, which is a two-story mixed-use building with four residential units, a deli grocery, and a barber shop on the ground floor. Looking across the street from the project area, this is a view of New Utrecht Avenue facing southeast with a one-story commercial building and the Verizon building on, the, on 16th Avenue in the background. This is a view of the corner of New Utrecht and 71st Street facing east. From this view, we can see Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Joseph Patrocino Playground, which is diagonally across the street from the project area. Moving south to the opposite end of the block, this is a view of the intersection of New Utrecht Avenue and 72nd Street with 16th Avenue on the other side of the elevated tracks. 
The proposed development is a nine-story, 85,000 square feet mixed-use building, 4.59 FAR. The building would contain 11,600 square feet of retail uses on the ground floor and 73,300 square feet of, re of residential uses on floors two through nine. This is the ground floor plan for the development site. The building would be set back five feet from the property line along New Utrecht Avenue, which is a C44L regulation, widening the sidewalk from 18 feet to 23 feet. There would also be an eight foot side yard between the building and the property line on the west side of the property, as well as an entrance to the parking garage on 72nd Street. The proposed development would have ground floor commercial with double height ceiling along New Utrecht Avenue, which would establish a commercial, commercial base facing the subway and thereby ensuring no dwelling units are situated immediately adjacent to the elevated subway line. The base is also intended to raise the residential floors above the tracks, which are then further set back. The second floor would contain residential amenity spaces and a laundry room adjacent to the subway with 10 units on the back side of the building. Floors three through nine would consist entirely of residential uses. 30% of the units, 30 units, would be income restricted pursuant to MIH option two, which mandates that 30% of the residential floor area be restricted for residents with incomes averaging 80% AMI. 35 par required parking spaces would be provided at a seller level. The building street wall would rise 25 feet and then set back 15 feet starting on the third floor facing New Utrecht, totaling 20 feet from the lot line for even more space between the elevated subway lines and the residential units, and then would rise an additional 70 feet for a total building height of 95 feet. Additionally, at the back of the building, beginning at the sixth floor, 55 feet, the building would set back an additional 22 feet to allow for light and air to the neighboring R5 district. Combined with an eight-foot side yard, this would produce a 30-foot buffer between the upper portion of the building and the adjacent R5 district. The proposed actions include a zoning map amendment to change existing R5 C22 district to a C44L district. C44L is specifically tailored for commercial corridors with elevated subway lines. It is intended to ensure that adequate light and air reach the sidewalk below the elevated rail line by establishing appropriate distance between buildings upper floors and the subway tracks. It also offers increased flexibility in uses to allow commercial uses below and adjacent to the elevated train. A C44L district is a contextual commercial district that allows mixed use buildings at a residential equivalent of R7A. A, an R7A district allows maximum residential FAR of 4.60 with MIH and an FAR of 4.0 for commercial and community facility uses. No parking is required for commercial uses and most community facility uses. Parking for market rate residential units must be provided at 50% of the units with no parking required for, for income restricted units within the transit zone. For lots fronting an elevated line, a 15 foot setback is required above the base height to shift the upper portion of the building away from the subway and the street wall must be set back five feet widening the sidewalk. A zoning text amendment would map MIH coterminous with the project area and would amend Appendix F of the zoning resolution by establishing the project area as a mandatory inclusionary housing area. MIH options are option one, requiring 25% of the residential floor area must be income restricted for residents with incomes averaging 60% AMI with a minimum of 10% of the housing to be affordable at 40% AMI and option two requires 30% of the residential floor area be income restricted for residents with incomes averaging 80% AMI. Pursuant to local law 78 of 2021, this application requires a racial equity report on housing and opportunity because it would increase the permitted residential floor area by at least 50,000 square feet. The proposed development would provide new housing units in a neighborhood that has experienced little housing production including providing new income restricted units in a highly transit accessible location. Although this area has experienced a population increase of 9.3% between 2010 and 2020, new housing production was minimal 
at an increase of 1.6%. Since 2014, only 107 new income-restricted units were developed in CD11 for low-income households, and none were developed for moderate-income households. In Figure 1, we see that the population of CD11 is predominantly Asian non-Hispanic and white non-Hispanic, with the percentage of Asian non-Hispanic residents at 44%, which exceeds both the borough at 14 and the city at 16%. The white non-Hispanic population, 36%, reflects borough and citywide percentages. In Figure 2, the percentage change in race, race and equity from 2010 and 2020 um, the largest growth was seen in the black non-Hispanic population, a smaller percentage of the total population of CD11, but has experienced a growth of 74% compared to a, compared to a decrease 9% borough-wide and a decrease 5% citywide. Hispanic Latino population increased the second largest, though also a smaller percentage of the total population with 30% growth compared to four borough-wide and 7% city, citywide. The white non-Hispanic population decreased 20% in CD11 compared to an increase of 8% borough-wide and no change citywide. In summary, this is a private application for a zoning map amendment from an R5 C22 to a C44L and a zoning text amendment to, a, to Appendix F to facilitate the development of a mixed-use building with 73,383 square feet of residential space, 100 units, 30 of which would be income-restricted, and 11,651 square feet of ground floor commercial. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, and congratulations on your first one. Great job. Great, great job. Um, so let me just run through a few uh, quick questions, and then I'll go to other commissioners. Um, first is, let's just talk about the C44L for a moment. Um, I understand this district, and we have seen it you know, in, at the commission before, uh, is designed to create a little bit of distance between an elevated uh, train and residential buildings. Can you just say a little bit more about, or and maybe just say it again, the what the zoning requirements as, are as it relates to how far the building needs to be mm -hmm. and what they are actually doing? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Chair. Rodnick. Um, in terms of C44L, so the facing the elevated subway line, we have um, an eight feet, uh, a five feet setback from the property line, which would uh, increase the sidewalk. And then also on the back of the building facing the R5 district, um, we have the setback that requires 30 feet from uh, and the neighboring district, which is a lower density district. Um, and so it'll rise 55 feet and then set back further for a total of 30 feet between the upper portion of the building and the neighboring R5 district. Okay, and on the front, on the side which faces the train. Yes. It's required to be five feet, and that is what they are doing. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, and they also have a two-story uh, base before the building sets back further. Is that also correct? Yes. Um, it'll have the two, the, the base, which includes uh, a double floor residential, or commercial, rather, um, space, and then it will set back further. Okay. So, and it sets back another 15 feet at the top above that 25-foot two-story commercial base. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Got it. Uh, the 35 parking spaces, you said those are the required, so they're at the, the minimum required number. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. Correct. Right. And uh, you said it was right on top of the D-Train entrance. Is that right? On top of, right immediately adjacent to the D-Train entrance. Is that right? To the entrance, yes. Okay. Uh, and um, I think you noted 107 income-restricted units created in this community district since 2014, if I heard you correctly. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Let's see if there are other questions. Mr. Goodrich.
what? We can get you another. We can get you another. We can get you another one too. You can also come up. Oh, sure. I was going to say I'm a loud speaker, so. Um. So I have a question about the uh, the affordability. It's only 100 units, so I think it's it's a it's a relatively small one. But from the racial just racial equity report, um, a couple of things: the area is more rent burdened than Brooklyn and then New York City. Um, it also, I think, I also saw somewhere where the 99.5% of the area has no affordable affordability or housing. Wait, let me get the quote. I think it was West Tabulation. Is that Does that sound familiar? <laughs> um, but the long and short of it is I was wondering if there was any conversation with the developer about the fact that there are only 30% of the units that will be affordable, but the area in particular um, has a population that the income is less than the income that the sixty thousand dollars that is starting for this, or the fifty six thousand dollars that's starting for this affordability. And I was wondering if there's any conversation with the developer about that. Thank you for the question. Uh, to clarify, if they're planning on ex how many units uh, affordable or the level? I mean yes. There's any plan at all to address. I mean, it's it, so essentially in the racial equity report, it's mentioned, but then when you read the part where they talk about where they describe in description, there's no um, resolution to that. So I'll have the applicant uh, speak further to that, to their discussions on um, the, the number and levels. Okay. Thank you. That's my only Thank question for now. Th Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Osorio. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I, I was I was wondering if you can encourage the applicant to expand a little bit on the findings uh, from the environmental impact statement on uh, the draft environmental impact statement on um, noise, air quality, and hazardous materials. Thank you. Thank you. I, I would like to know um, also that the property will receive an E designation for noise. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner, uh, Vice Chair Knuckles. Thank you. Um, in the, in the uh, racial equity report, um, could you remind me of what the acronym PUMA is, Jen, if you know? That is. <laughs> yeah. Here, somebody's got it. Um, Public use microdata area. Public use microdata area. Okay. <laughs> Uh, while, while you're there, perhaps you can. Uh, yeah, you <laughs> <laughs> I'm just here for the acronym. Oh, okay. Well, you you let me chat. Let me challenge you anyway. Uh, in Figure Five of the um, racial equity report, where it talks about share of households in each uh, HUD AMI band, and there's a chart with which has. Um, shows the share of Puma households within uh, the HUD area median by exclusively race and Hispanic ethnicity of householder. My question is, um, if you look at the graphic, there are lines, you know, that, that extend from each uh, demographic uh, definition. And I'm just wondering, uh, you know, for instance, um, the African American, in an earlier um, chart, it indicates that the African American population in this area is 1%. But if you look at this chart, uh, there's a level of 20%, and then there's a line that extends to it. Bottom line is, I, I don't know how to read this chart, and, and I'm just wondering if... if um, I believe I can I can help. Yeah. Um, so the the lines that are uh, that are on the the chart and they're there's sort of it's like an eye shape. Yeah. So the, yes. that's the degree of sort of uncertainty within the um, thing that's being sort of charted here. And so it, it, and when with and specifically when we have very smaller small population 
uh, segments, for example, in this case, the, the small African American population in this in this neighborhood, the um, certain things like the uh, share of households, you know, with median incomes of a certain level, it's harder for um, for us to know what that is because the, this is from the American Community Survey, which is just a survey that's that asks you know, a number of people, a segment of the population, and then they're trying to sort of apply that to the whole population. And that uh, introduces a degree of uncertainty that, that those lines are trying to capture. So what that is saying, and if I'm looking at the chart for moderate incomes for the uh, black non-Hispanic population, you know, it, it tops out at, I think, uh, 30%. Yes. But but it could go it could go all the way up to forty five percent or go all the way down to fifteen percent because the population there is so small that the amount of people that they surveyed um, creates a lot of uncertainty so um I guess the the size of the lines is the grain of salt with which you should <laughs> take these statistics, and it's just a matter of of trying to um you know, understand how populations, um, you know, how surveys apply to certain populations. All right. Thank you, Ryan. That's, that, that's helpful. Um, I know we're at the certification stage and this is, you know, we'll be seeing this again. So, um, I, I just like to, uh, indicate that I will have, there's a lot of information, um, in this, in this particular study, as well as, you know, the broader report. And, um, but I have a particular interest in who would market this project, um, which generally they're, they're, they're local nonprofits that do it. But um, I, I have a real interest in who is going to market the project and the extent to which all of the impacted communities here will be uh, impacted by uh, hopefully an effective marketing outreach effort. Um, great. Uh, thank you for the question, Commissioner. Um, I'll have the applicant speak to that. Are, are you talking in terms of the units? Um, I am. I am talking about outreach to um, um, the various groups that comprise mm -hmm. this area. So, so for the affordable units, the affordable units, yeah, yeah, yeah there are thirty not for profit. Yeah, there are thirty out of out of uh, one hundred. We can drill so down. So obviously, on that. there will be uh, uh, you know an intense interest in these units, and I just want to make sure that that the marketing reaches everyone. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Commissioner Goodrich. I have two more questions. The first is for the construction workers, um, do you know if they will be unionized, if it'll be unionized labor? Uh, thank you for the question. I will have the applicant speak to that. Okay, thank you. And then I have just a larger question. Is So this, this is, um, since this is only 100 units going forward, are these, is this a type of project that will not require an environmental review? Since it's under the 200 units under the the city of Yes plan, I believe that the this it's the affordable units. It's how many units are there in this project? Yeah, it's it's, I think it's anything under 200 units. But I, that's not talk Susan, gonna come up Susan okay. let's okay. let Susan talk. Yeah, to sorry. <laughs> so um, the 200 units is um, at this point something that we're looking at. Um, what we're trying to do is figure out what number of units we can say with other criteria um, have in the past not required environmental review so that we can um, identify them and adopt a rule. So we have to go through CAPA um, that would say that they are not subject to environmental review going forward. But um, at this point, we are not, we haven't done the research to figure out precisely what the criteria are that um, would allow us to do this. It's, it's creating a new, um, what's known as a type two, um, and there's state requirements for doing that. We have to do the research and then we have to go through a rulemaking. So 
at this point, th- that's um, something that we are working on, not something that is going to exist in the, you know, anytime in the, like, very short term. I I saw a news article about this. I thought this was a done deal. No, it's announced as something that we are, um, oh, okay. that we want to accomplish, but it, there are many steps that have to be taken in order to get there. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Benjamin. So that's one question. Um, will the mayor be amending the executive order to add to the Type 2 list, or is city planning going to have their own Type 2 list irrespective of the executive order? It's not done by the executive order. Um, it won't be done by the executive order. The last time we did a Type 2 was an, an actual rulemaking mm-hmm. under the rules, city planning rules, and then... Uh, presumably, like HPD would also adopt similar rules to govern their projects. But it has to be a, a rulemaking. Does the council get involved then, since they have to? City planning is generally the lead agency, but they're an involved agency in most of these. Um, in the rulemaking, they won't have, you know, the council doesn't need to, you know, doesn't have a specific role in there, but. Um, and it's really supposed to be based on a factual analysis of, in the past, what has required environment review and what has not required environment review. Right, but the council will have to accept that there is no longer an environmental review for things that they're voting on. Um, any, you know, as all... You may want to think about how, how you're going to... How we interact with the council as something that we would definitely do. Thank you. Commissioner, Commissioner Osorio. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Susan, for that. I had a quick follow-up question. Uh, it, the, <laughs> sorry. It's, okay. it's clear that um, we don't have a role in that process, right? It, it's uh, the CPC. But is, can we, how can we be useful maybe in uh, sort of discussing the analysis or, or as you move forward with the research? would love to be useful in, as we think about that. Um, right now, our research is really going back historically to see what's um, required environmental review or not required environmental review in the past. Um, the commission actually will have a role um, because the commission is the lead agency. Um, it would need to be a commission rule. So when we're at the point of trying to move this forward, we'll be back in front of the commission and presenting what we found and why we're trying to draw lines in a particular, you know, and, and why we're trying to draw the lines we're drawing. And, and what role is that? Would we vote on that? Um, well, you'd have to adopt the rule. Oh. Yes. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. Thank you. Ryan, anybody on line with their hand up? Okay, great. This item is certified. Thank you very much. Great job. Let's move on to the next item. Okay. The uh, third item on our agenda is a certification of a special permit in Brooklyn Community District 17, and our presenter is Lucia Capuccio. Thank you. Um, uh, good afternoon, Chair Garodnik and Commissioner. So this is a private application from Clarendon Holding, LLC, for his zoning special permit 74932, self-service storage facility, Locate in sub-area two of Appendix J, designated areas within manufacturing districts, to facilitate a new five-story, 73,715-square-foot self-service storage facility in Community District 17, East Flatbush, Brooklyn. So the project area is located on Kings Highway between Whitty Lane and Farragut Road in Community District 17, Brooklyn. So this is an aerial view looking north. Uh, The project is in East Flatbush, as I mentioned. It's a neighborhood in the center of Brooklyn, bounded by Crown Heights and Brownsville to the north, Canarsie to the east, Flatlands to the south, and Flatbush to the west. The project area consists of one flag-shaped interior lot with entrances on Kings Highway and East 56th Street. To the west of the project area is Kings Highway and Utica Avenue. Utica Avenue is served by the B46 Select Bus Service with express service from Bushwick to Marine Park. And the nearest subway stop, Newkirk Avenue, Little Haiti, um, which serves the two and the five trains, is located off the map 1.4 miles away. Adjacent to the site on the eastern and southern portions is the MTA Bay Ridge Branch, which is currently an active freight route. 
It is also currently planned to be used for the Interborough Express or IBX route in the future. Directly to the north of the project area are low density residential homes, um, including attached two story homes on Whitty Lane and the Clarendon Garden Apartments. Uh, this view shows um, the project area within the context of the Flatlands Fairfield Industrial Business Zone or IBZ, which is overlaid here in purple. This site um, indicated in orange, is on the north side of the rail cut and directly abuts the residential R4 district um, and the backyards of the Ruity Lane uh, residences. IBZs were created in 2005 and provide support and incentives for industrial business relocation and expansion. Uh, the Flatlands Fairfield IBZ is one of six IBZs in Brooklyn and it runs literally along um, the Bay Ridge Branch rail cut uh, and it, um, sorry, through East Flatbush, Canarsie, and Brownsville. So here we can see the project area. Um, it's outlined in orange in the center of the land use map. Uh, the light yellow lots on the map are all residential uses in the surrounding area off of Kings Highway and the surrounding side streets. Um, and they range from single family detached houses to low density three story walk up apartment buildings. Many of the nearby homes are attached um, and semi-detached two-story buildings. The purple lots include a range of one-story light industrial businesses, warehousing and distribution facilities, and scrap metal and open storage uses. The Brooklyn Terminal Market is located approximately four blocks east of the project area on the south side of the rail cut. The project area is located on the block, on a block with a mix of uses, and they include a medical and prescription supply distributor, a food manufacturer and distributor, an auto dealer and repair shop, and a two-family residence. The project area is mapped um, within an M11 zoning district. The M11 district permits a wide array of commercial and light manufacturing, as well as some community facility uses. M11 districts permit commercial uses at an FAR of 1 and community facility uses at an FAR of 2.4. Building height is governed by the sky exposure plane and parking requirements will vary by use. The surrounding area is also zoned with residential districts, including R4 and R5. R4 is a low-density low general residential, residential district for single, two-family, and multifamily homes with a maximum FAR of 0.75. The R5 district is also a low-density general residence district that permits residential buildings up to 1.25 FAR and community facility buildings up to two FAR. This view takes a northern aerial view um, to show a complete picture of the project area. So the project area consists of one a regularly shaped, flag-shaped interior lot um, outlined here in orange. There are currently two entrances to the lot. One is on Kings Highway and one is on the dead end of East 56th Street. Uh, for the proposed facility, only the entrance on Kings Highway would be active. Um, the entrance would be 30, foot wide, 30 feet wide with separated lanes for a vehicular driveway and a pedestrian walkway. The site is currently unimproved and is used for automobile parking. Historically, as shown in the inset here, this lot has never been utilized as an industrial manufacturing use, going from farmland in the 1920s to covered tennis courts in the 1950s and a school bus Tebow and automobile sales from the mid 1990s until today. Um, this photo shows um, it's looking east from Kings Highway, um, where we can see the project area, which consists of a driveway into the interior lot. The lots on either side of the driveway are not included in the project area. This view looks southwest at the back entrance of the project area. East 56th Street hits a dead end due to the Long Island Railroad tracks at this location, and the driveway is semi-obscured. Uh, this view looks west at the East 56th Street entrance, as if we've zoomed in from the previous view. To the right of the entrance are the rear lot backyards of the Whitty Lane residences, which are 30 feet deep and directly above the project area. The proposed development to be facilitated by the special permit is a 73,715 square foot, five-story um, self-service storage facility. The facility would have an FAR of one, and a height of 62 feet with a clock tower rising to 85 feet. 
12 parking spaces and four loading berths would be provided. So this is a site plan of the proposed development. A development will be set back 34 feet from the rear lot line of the Whitty Lane backyards and screening or fencing will be put in place along this perimeter. Additionally, planted shrubs will be provided along the southern and eastern portions of the lot. This is a closer look at the floor plan of the proposed development. Uh, here you can see the pedestrian entrance at the top left corner of the building. The proposed flow of traffic, including the parking spaces, are located around the perimeter of the building. And the plantings will be located around the perimeter, perimeter of the eastern and southern portions of the lot. So the proposed action for this project is a special permit, 74932, self-service storage facility located in sub-area 2 of Appendix J, designated areas within manufacturing districts. To grant such a permit, the Commission shall find that the zoning lot is appropriate for such self-service storage facility use based on the land use characteristics of the proposed zoning lot and the surrounding area. In making this determination, the Commission may consider the following eight considerations. The Commission may also impose appropriate conditions and safeguards to minimize any adverse effects upon the existing uses in the surrounding area. The applicant has responded to these considerations in their statement of findings, which can be found in the Commission's briefing packet. So in summary, this is a private application for a zoning special permit 74932 self-service storage facility located in sub-area 2 of Appendix J, designated areas within manufacturing districts. Um, thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you very much. Um, let me just uh, pose a couple of questions to start here. Um, obviously, this is a relatively new special permit in that it is required for self-storage in certain areas of the city, which are coterminous with what we might recognize as industrial business zones. Um, <clears throat> our finding here is that the zoning lot in question is appropriate for such self-storage facility. But we also can consider things such as the economic development objectives for, of the city for the designated area, which raises some interesting questions for us and as it relates to this application and perhaps for many, if not most, self-service, self-storage applications. But let's focus on this one for a moment. And I recognize that you are not the applicant. So we're going to pose these questions to the applicant in a more appropriate way, but we will also just tee this up for them a little bit as they come to us through this process. Um, as you pointed out, this, uh, this lot is right next to the MTA Bay Ridge branch, which could be the future pathway of the uh, IBX. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, uh, and if there were to be an IBX at some point in the future, where would be the closest stop to this lot? Um, I can answer that. Uh, the MTA has seen this application. Um, they reviewed it. They did not see any issues um, in terms of the encroachment. There's no encroachment on the on the railroad tracks, and um, the MTA hasn't released um, stops yet for the IBX. So um, we don't know where the uh, stops will be. Okay. Is it possible that there might be an IBX stop somewhere within, let's say, a handful of blocks of this site? I would defer to the MTA on that. Okay. So that's a question that I think we would need to think about as we're considering the economic development opportunities for the site, recognizing that we don't have an IBX there now, but we need to evaluate whether this is consistent with our objectives, and that might actually be consistent with our objectives. Um, on the north side of the site, it looks like there is that pathway where you would enter in to be able to access the self-storage, and on the, the north side of that access point, it looks like there are homes right there. Is that, is that a fair reading of this diagram? Yeah, so directly north of the project area are two-story attached um, Whitty Lane residences, um, but there is a 30-foot rear backyard that they have, and then there is a 34-foot um, 
kind of clearance area. So the storage unit, the proposed unit would be at least 34 feet from the lot line, and then there would be an additional 30 feet from the backyards to the homes. And there's no way to access the private property to the north today through that through that uh, entrance no, point, right? No, it's fenced off currently. And that is because that, that pathway is private property for the folks who own the lot that's seeking to be developed as self-storage. I'm sorry, I think I've The entrance point for the self-storage facility? That's currently owned by the, it's on the lot. It's not private. It's, I mean, it's privately owned. There's the Whitty Lane residences, and then there's the driveway, which is owned by um, the applicant. Right. The driveway yes. is owned by the applicant yes. that wants to develop the self-storage. Yes. Right. So you can't access the Whitty Lane building from... No, that's from... private. Yeah, that, those are private homes. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Um, would there be any benefit to the resident? I'm looking for the possible benefit here. Would there be any possible benefit to the residents of Whitty Lane if this were developed as self-storage from a land use perspective? I would have the applicant speak to that. Um, I will I will note that they've done outreach to the Whitty, Lone, uh, Whitty Lane residents, homeowners already, um, but I'll have them speak to those conversations that they've had. Okay, great. Okay, got it. Thank you. Let's see if there are other questions. Commissioner Osorio. Thank you for the presentation. Really quickly, uh, if you can, when this comes back, uh, I'm wondering if the applicants can, well, the question for you, but also a question for the applicants, if the applicants can talk a little bit about the um, implications or opportunities to mitigate impact given the historic contamination of the site uh, regarding the Jamaica Bay Watershed Protection Plan. And the question that I, that I want to ask you, that's, that's a question for the applicant, but the question I want to ask you is, it sounds from the EAS that, um, the applicant has um, met the requirements or the recommendations that DEP has made regarding the remedial action plan and the construction health and safety plan. But I was wondering if you if you can share a little bit about, it seems that there's been a little bit of a back and forth. Uh, what is pending from that? Well, I'd have to follow up on you that. I, I, it has received an E designation, a negative E designation as of Friday. Okay. So I believe it is um, complete, but I can have, uh, I, I can follow up on that for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Other questions? Mr. Buzzard? I was just looking for clarification on, um, uh, or in, and sometimes when, when these things are referenced in our briefing documents, if there could be either a link or laid out in, in clearer terms, like what, what uses are under use group 16D, 17, 18, um, just for members of the public listening or others who aren't technical planners um, would be helpful to understand. Sure. Um, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll take that note. Yeah, um, 16 usually involves like lighter industrial, including automobile sale, um, automobile repair and sales, and then 17 is light industrial, and then 18 is heavy industrial use, like an incinerator. But noted, we can do that in the future. 18 is only permitted in M3? I, yeah, I believe so, yes. And I'll just note, I had similar questions as you, Chair, um, about just the, it's a major opportunity, this site, and how it feeds into um, kind of the economic development goals of the area um, and the city in general. And one, one last question along those lines. You know, one might imagine since there, there's potentially some gap of time between now and the uh, future IBX train, uh, whether one could develop a self-storage facility and then redevelop it at a later date. Have we seen any evidence of self-storage facilities being redeveloped after any period of time in, um, in Brooklyn or other or elsewhere, or once they come, are they with us forever? <laughs> I think I know the answer to this question, but I just I figured I would uh, I would ask. ask it's a, it's a really good question. I, I don't. I'm not aware of a self a new constructed self storage facility being converted or, or redeveloped. I will say that they per square footage they're pretty high value, um, and so there would have to be a pretty different use allowed on the site to compete with a, with a self storage use, which is one of the reasons why we have the the. A special permit today is to ensure that we're making the right decision and long term long term for these sites. Great, thank you, thank you, Alex. Okay, 
Uh, great. Thank you very much. This item is certified, and we'll look forward to seeing it again uh, down the line. Thank you, Lucia. All right. Thank you. Okay, Ryan. All right. So the fourth item on our agenda is a certification of a zoning map and zoning tax amendment in Queens Community District 14. Our presenter is Alake Ade. Hi, Alake. Hello. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Garardik and Commissioners. Um, This is a proposal by a private applicant, the community builders, requesting two actions, a zoning map amendment to rezone the development site and two other lots within the project area from an R41 to an R6A, and a zoning tax amendment to establish an MIH area to facilitate construction of a new eight-story building containing approximately 106 income-restricted units and 1,991 square feet of community facility space at 2932 Beach Channel Drive in Basewater, Queens Community District 14. The Community Builders, TCB, is a nonprofit real estate developer that has developed over 30,000 units of housing and invested in 2.8 million feet of residential, commercial, and community space in 15 states. TCB currently owns or manages over 13,000 units across the country. TCB would serve as the proposed development's developer, owner, and manager. The project area is outlined in red. It's located approximately a half mile west of the downtown Far Rockaway rezoning area, which was approved in 2017. While not in the transit zone, the pro uh, project area has good access to public transit with the Beach 25th Street subway station servicing the A-Line located two blocks east. There are also multiple bus lines serving the area. The project area is indicated in black and is bounded by Ocean Crest Boulevard to the north Bay 32nd Street to the west, and Beach Channel Drive to the south. The project area was mapped with an R6 in 1961 and was rezoned to its current R41 district as a part of the 2008 Rockaway Neighborhoods Rezoning, which affected approximately 280 blocks. The rezoning's goal was to preserve the skill, character, and character of the Rockaway's neighborhoods affected and to ensure that future residential development will be predictable and in context with traditional building patterns. According to the applicant, this broad approach at, uh, conflicted with the scale of most of the project area by making the existing six-story building on the development site and the existing five-story building on lot one overbuilt and therefore non-compliant. The surrounding area is characterized by a mix of residential, community facility, and commercial uses. The area immediately sur uh, surrounding the project area is in R32, R41, R4A, R6, and R6A with C2-2 overlay districts. is mostly comprised of one and two family detached and semi-detached residential buildings ranging from one to three stories. Community facility uses are, which are shaded on this map in blue include a charter school, a high school, a nursing home, and a medical office. Commercial uses in red include the beach channel, Shopping Center, uh, shopping center, which includes a grocery store and other local retail uses. Open space uses shaded in green include Basewater Park, which is located directly across Bay 32nd Street from the project area. The development site is partially in the 100-year and 500-year floodplains. The project proposed development would incorporate measures to provide resiliency from climate change and sea level rise. This tax map shows the project area, which is outlined with the black, dotted black line and includes block 15744, lots 1, 7, and part of 18. Lot 18, which is outlined in red, is comprised of the, of the development site and would be subject to a zoning lot development agreement between the private owner and the applicant. Here we have a closer view of the project area in context with its immediate surroundings. The development site is outlined in red and is comprised of a six-story residential building and a vacant area that would be the site of the proposed development. The proposed development will be adjacent to the existing building. The buildings immediately surrounding the project area are mostly two- to three-story residences, and just outside the surrounding area to the south, in an R6 district along the elevated subway line, there are two 20-story Mitchell Lama buildings that were built in 1975, 
Each tower has 231 dwelling units and approximately 140 at grade parking spaces. The high school mentioned earlier is in the large educational campus partially in view here, located immediately to the northeast of the project area and is developed with an approximately 46,000 square foot area that consists of numerous middle and high schools, such as the Academy of Medical Technology, the Queens High School for Information, Research and Technology, and more. The Beach Channel Shopping Center is located one block southwest of the project area and contains a one-story commercial strip mall with a grocery store, takeout restaurants, a beauty a pharmacy, a beauty supply, laundromat, and a parking lot with 150 spaces. Additional commercial retail and food spots are located along the elevated IRT A line. Open space uses include Bayswater Park, which is located directly across the street from the project area and includes amenities such as a skate park, playground, sports fields, courts, and more. An application that is currently undergoing public review is 2446 Far Rockaway Boulevard Rezoning, which is located one block east of the Ocean Crest Rezoning, rezoning Project Area. Its project area is outlined in purple and the development site in light blue. Zooming down further, lot one is improved with a five-story non-profit institution with sleeping accommodations building containing 44 units and three outdoor spaces for parking. And lot 18, which fronts on Ocean Crest Boulevard, is improved with a two-story residential building, three apartments, and a one-car garage. The development site, lot 7, is an irregular lot with an area of approximately 58,991 square feet. It is currently improved with a six-story residential building containing 107 apartments and 48 parking spaces in the cellar. The vacant portion currently serves as parking space for a landscaping company. Here's a view of the development site as seen from the corner of Ocean Crest Boulevard and Bay 32nd Street. Here we have the, a view of the development site as seen from Ocean Crest Boulevard, as well as the curb cut for vehicular access. Here is the view of Basewater's, Basewater Park as shown when facing away from the development site on the corner of Ocean Crest Boulevard and Bay 32nd Street. The applicant is proposing an eight-story mixed-use building with approximately 106 income-restricted dwelling units of which approximately 27 would be subject to MIH. 17 units would be designated for formerly house, homeless households. The proposed 90,985 square foot building would also contain approximately 1,991 square feet of community facility space on the ground floor. 35 parking spaces would be available at grade four residential tenants. Since the proposed development site is in the 100 and 500 year floodplains, it would incorporate measures to provide resiliency for flood events, climate change, and sea level rise. Non-mechanical uses on the ground floor will be elevated above the 100 year floodplain through the 2080s. Mechanical equipment located on the ground floor will be placed an additional foot above the design flood elevation. This slide shows the site plan of the proposed development. The ground floor plan here shows the community facility space shaded in light purple, which is likely to be a daycare and a dedicated entrance on Bay 32nd Street and the, and the residential and first floor entrance on Ocean Crest Boulevard. The ground floor would also have space for mechanical services and a protected bike storage space. Cars would access the at-grade 35 parking spaces here via a curb cut on Ocean Crest Boulevard. Parking spaces located in the existing building cellar would be accessed in the same manner as shown by the gray arrows. An existing garage door on the adjacent building, circle here in red, will provide access in and out of both buildings. Zoom in, zoom in out. This slide shows the development site with the location of the proposed development outlined in red in context with the existing adjacent building, which is located on the southeast portion of Lot 7. As mentioned earlier, Lot 7 will be subdivided into two tax lots pursuant to a zoning lot development agreement between the applicant and the private owner, with the applicant purchasing the northwestern portion of the development site from the private owner. The existing building will remain on Lot 7 after the subdivision. 
The 48 parking spaces in the existing building cellar would again, as indicated by the gray arrows, be accessed from Ocean Crest Boulevard onto the driveway underneath the proposed development and into the existing uh, building's cellar garage door. Floors two through eight would comprise of units ranging in size from studio to three bedroom units. The proposed R6A zoning district would permit a maximum base height of 60 feet and a maximum building height of 80 feet and would require parking spaces for 25% of new affordable units. Mm -hmm. The applicant believes adding a building contain, containing and come restricted dwelling units at this location is appropriate because of its proximity to public transit access, retail, recreational, and community facilities. The rezoning would also re restore two buildings in the project area, lots one and seven, to compliance. To facilitate this uh, development, the applicant proposes a zoning map amendment to change the project area from an R41 district to an R6A district indicated by the dotted black line on the image to the right. The change would also bring existing non-compliant buildings within the project area into compliance. R6A districts generally produce buildings at a seven to eight story scale. They also allow for maximum base heights of up to 65 feet and maximum building heights of up to 80 feet for buildings provided in MIH and 85 feet for buildings with qualifying ground floors. The applicant is also proposing a zoning tax amendment to map MIH and is seeking MIH option one. Option one requires that 25% of the floor area be provided to households at an average of 60% AMI. For reference, the median household income in Community District 14 is approximately $55,364 annually or roughly 40% AMI for a family of four. This application requires a racial equity report because it would increase the residential floor area by at least 50,000 50, square feet. The annual me median household income for CD14 is approximately 55,000, which is lower than those for the borough of Queens and New York City overall. The applicant proposes to provide 106 income restricted units across a range of zero to 80% AMI with estimated monthly rents ranging from 700 for a studio unit to 2,400 for a two bedroom unit at an estimated average income from 28,000 for a one person household to 106,700 for a four person household. Of the approximately 124,000 residents within CD14, 3% identify as Asian, 36% identify as black, 23% identify as Latino, and 32% identify as white. Between 2010 and 2020, the area saw an increase in Asian and Latino populations, a very slight increase in the black population and a very slight decrease in the white population. In summary, the applicant is seeking two actions, a map amendment to rezone the project area from an R41 to an R6A to facilitate the proposed development. The applicant also seeks a tax amendment to establish an MIH area. The proposed development would rise to a height of 80 feet and would include ground floor community facility space and approximately 106 income restricted dwelling, <coughs> dwelling units. These actions would also return the exist, two existing buildings in the project area to compliance. That concludes my presentation and I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you very much. Only two quick ones from me. Uh, the first is you noted that, um, you noted both that in 2001, the area in question was rezoned to an R41 to preserve the character yes. of the neighborhood, and also that that made a number of buildings on the site non-compliant. Yes. Did I get you right? Yes. Uh, so just if you can articulate for us the best argument for an R6A here, as opposed to keeping things as is, what would you what would you say? Um, so, first off, the applicant uh, says uh, the site is across on a Y Street across Basewater Park, Basewater Park, um, and also they provide an eight side um, yard, eight foot side yard on along uh, 
July 18th. Uh, also, uh, they're within um, 25 feet of lot 18, they don't have, they limit their building height to 45 feet. So um, that, along with not uh, using the full allowed height, uh, which would be which would be um, given with a qualifying ground floor, was not implemented here. So, um, uh, the, so that was their reasoning for um, uh, an R6A district. Okay. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, and I think that um, we would also add that this site is kitty corner from an existing R6A, as well as being proximate to the A train transit resources. So we do think that this is an area that can certainly receive an R6A designation. Okay, great. Uh, and then the uh, the only other question for me is the the 106 units of affordable. Uh, 27 were MIH, 17 were supportive, and the rest of them are uh, done through a regulatory, like a different regulatory agreement with HPD. Is that right? Yes. Do you know which ones at this stage of the game? Uh, so. Uh, according to the applicant, it would be Ella, um, extremely low and uh, low affordability mm -hmm. program. Right, Ella, but they're all Ella. Yeah, all the rest of them are Ella. Yeah. Okay, got it. Thank you, Commissioner Osorio. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your presentation. That was very clear. Uh, just two quick questions. One, you mentioned uh, a couple times that uh, there's uh, been significant recognition of the vulnerability to coastal flooding, and um, a interest and in, in, uh, kind of like the decision to mitigate that. Can, do, you, do you have a sense of what those measures have been included so far? Um, what has been discussed at least so far? Yes. Yeah, so um, the applicant, the proposed development would be at a uh, design flood elevation of uh, 2.33 feet, and um, which is um, above like three feet above the um, base flood elevation. Um, they also make sure to place uh, mechanical equipment at an additional um, one foot above the um, design flood elevation. Um, also, they also according to the applicant, they would um, install deployable floodgates at the uh, community facility um, frontage, install flood vents uh, located at exterior and interior walls, and. Uh, Replace all windows, doors, and finishes with uh, flood damage resistant materials in case of uh, flood events. So, thank you, thank you very much. And I had another quick question: uh, the, What is more or less the plan, or what do, what do you see is the relationship between the current income requirements um, or, or the proposed sort of MIH uh, breakdown with with what the race equity report shows, where there's a significant difference between the median household income of uh, Hispanic families uh, as compared to white non-Hispanics. According to the report, a white non-Hispanic median household income is around 42.5, whereas a white non-Hispanics is almost 78. Okay. So so how, how do you think that we could sort of uh, think about this project in terms of making sure that those uh, racial and uh, race, uh, racial ethnic groups that have such a lower median household income could benefit as 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 well. Okay. Um, I'm not entirely sure how to answer that, so I'll uh, ask the applicant to uh, speak to that. And thank you for that question. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. So thank you very much. Okay. Uh, this item is now uh, certified, and we'll move on to the next. The fifth item on our agenda is a certification of a special permit and a city map amendment and a referral of zoning authorizations in Staten Island Community District 3. Our presenter is Barry Fisher. Hello, Barry. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Good afternoon, Chair. Uh, this is a private application by a Veterans Re Realty Corp requesting a city map amendment to add an unopened record street to the city map, a special permit for certain retail establishments in an M district. South Richmond Development Authorizations for Modification of Topography and Group Parking Facility Regulations, and a Staten Island Authorization to waive a cross-access connection to facilitate a 50,000-square-foot commercial development located in 
on Veterans Road West in Charleston Community District 3 in Staten Island. Next slide, please. Oh, uh, yes, next slide. The Charleston neighborhood is on Staten Island's western shore near the Outer Bridge Crossing and is bounded by State Highway Route 440, which goes over that bridge and is known as the West Shore Expressway in Staten Island. Buildings that were facilitated by prior commission approvals include the Tides of Charleston, which is a waterfront senior housing community in North 3-2 District, which you see on the left, uh, uh, labeled with yellow text. The Bricktown Center at Charleston, which is a regional retail center with big, top, big box stores in M11 and C41 districts, and a public library all in the upper middle, as well as a supermarket to the right of the development site, which, which is outlined in red. Next slide, please. Veterans Road West is actually a service road for the West Shore Expressway, which comes from the north and turns west here and then terminates at an intersection with Arthur Kill Road, which is a primary arterial through Charleston. Additional uses in the surrounding area are eclectic and include local and regional retail, at least one restaurant, office space, wholesale building supply, self-storage, an animal adoption center, automobile service, and an MTA bus depot. The project area consists of a roughly 100,000 square foot development site in the middle and, its heart and the entirety of Warner Street, which is an unimproved record street running 440 feet north from its intersection with Veterans Road West and terminates at Fairview Park, uh, which actually extends, the, 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 the parkland extends a little bit farther uh, west than, uh, the, than the colors on this map. Uh, and. Um, you can note that uh, you can see other record street spurs uh, like Warner Street on this map, but they are not part of this private application. The site itself is in an M11 district and is currently used for open vehicle storage, uh, an open uh, storage of construction equipment, which is use group 16. Next slide, please. This site is 174 feet of frontage on Veterans Road West, so you can uh, see a view of Veterans Road West on, on the right. On the left is a view of the site. It does not have trees, but you can see uh, the park land in the background. Next slide, please. This is a view of Warner Street, which is, of course, unbuilt. It's a 30 foot, or, or, sorry, a 35 foot wide record street. Next slide, please. The site is located to the left now, so north is, is uh, to, to your left. And uh, uh, Veterans Road West, uh, you know, the street of Veterans Road West is on your right. The requested actions would facilitate development of two commercial buildings totaling about 50,000 square feet of floor area with an FAR of 0 0.49 and 167 accessory parking spaces. Building A is proposed as a two-story building with 32,000 square feet of retail, roughly at grade, and over 15,000 square feet of office space above, and 15, 56 parking spaces in the cellar. Building B is a small retail pad to the lower right uh, to include a drive through window uh, and a queuing area for a minimum of eight cars and likely to be developed as a bank or restaurant. Proposed bicycle racks would exceed bicycle parking requirements. The applicant proposes a primary access curb cut on Veterans Road West on the right side, so building entrances are set back, uh, which encourages people to drive into the site before maneuvering their car into a parking space to avoid congestion. A second curb cut is proposed on the opposite side of this open parking lot to allow a separate egress for vehicles, which provides continuous circulation and a wider 30-foot wide drive aisle. The applicant also proposes to construct a 35 foot wide, or, sorry, a 30 foot wide roadway uh, within the bed of Warner Street, as well as a five foot sidewalk. A third curb cut would then be near the terminus of Warner Street on the left uh, side of this diagram for to access the cellar parking in Building A. Regarding transit, there are two local bus routes using Veterans Road West. Both of these routes start at the ferry terminal and then. Sorry, and then near the nearby Bricktown Retail Center. Next slide, please. <coughs> the 
The applicant requests a special permit which allows the department store uses in use group 10A and food stores without size limitation in a manufacturing district. This would facilitate a wider variety of retail, including uh, use group 6 or 10A, on the first floor of building A, which again is on the left. Uh, for this special permit, the commission must meet findings summarized here, which widely apply to the uh, open parking, uh, which would be utilized by the department store, any department stores. First, uh, the primary access is not from a narrow street, is the first finding, and that, uh, that the proposed um, site plan does not draw traffic into local streets. The applicant proposes a primary curb cut on the 80-foot wide Veterans Road West, which is near highway access ramps. The commission must also find that there is adequate reservoir space at the vehicular entrance and uh, also that uh, sufficient vehicular ingress and egress is provided to prevent congestion. So as I mentioned, the building layout avoids congestion at this entrance and provides a wide and relatively straight drive aisle to a separate curb cut on the opposite side of the parking lot, which is at least 400 feet away. I discussed the two nearby local bus routes and regarding the last uh, findings about use compatibility and character of the area, the proposed retail and office uses are similar to the supermarket, big box retail, and so forth east of the site and could provide more services also to near uh, residents, uh, closer to residents living in the tides of Charleston. Next slide, please. The next action is uh, an amendment to the city map in order to officially give Warner Street a final mapped status, so it, it would add this street. It's already city owned and proposed curb cuts on it would help meet findings for the other requested actions. Next slide, please. So the applicant also requests three commission authorizations that are specific to zoning in Staten Island. In the special South Richmond Development District, authorizations are required for over 30 parking spaces to ensure that the location of such vehicular access and egress permits better site planning and traffic in residential streets is minimized. And egress, uh, sorry, and uh, I touched on those in prior slides. And an authorization for modification of topography if more than two feet of cut or fill of the natural grade is proposed. The applicant requests these actions to allow the 167 total parking spaces and up to nine feet of fill towards the middle of this site, as well as up to four feet of cut for the loading berths in the rear. The existing grade uh, slopes up towards the rear, which you can uh, see from the uh, section at the top of the screen. Uh, the parking lot has uh, been, uh, had Phil proposed to be added underneath it in order to create a, a gradual slope instead of a, a choppy slope for safety. The applicant also requests an authorization for a waiver of cross access connection. So cross access is required between any commercial or community fi facility uses in Staten Island manufacturing and some uh, commercial districts to help reduce congestion on streets so that shoppers driving from one store to another store on an adjacent site need not enter the street. So as you can see from the top of this site plan uh, in, in very light gray, lighter than the uh, proposed buildings, uh, there are existing buildings on the adjacent lots that would uh, make cross access along with this development infeasible. So, Separate from CPC review, an additional chair certification is requested to waive uh, cross access also, particularly to the north of the site, where again, the site, uh, the, the natural terrain slopes up and uh, it would also make a future potential connection uh, too steep. Next slide, please. So in summary, the applicant requests a special permit for a certain large retail establishment, a city map amendment to add a street, authorization for waiver of cross access connection, modification of existing topography, and modification of group parking facility regulations in order to facilitate a roughly 50,000 square foot retail and commercial development that could 
uh, be compatible with and even support a wide variety of existing uses in the neighborhood. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so we've got the special permit, the city map amendment, and we've got the authorizations. Um, on the authorizations, I just will note something that I learned in preparation for this uh, conversation here. That is part of the special South Richmond district, the, the cross ac access connection. I'm saying this looking at Commissioner Cerullo because he knows what, I, what I'm going to say, is required to connect parking lot to parking lot in this area so as to keep cars from unnecessarily going onto the street which I thought was from one, from one, from one shopping, shopping center to another shopping center. I just thought that was interesting. Anyway, this is a, is a waiver of that because there is no connection to another shopping center, another large retail right next door. Is that correct? And that's why they're seeking that waiver. Well, yeah, it's, it's blocked by buildings. Uh, there is between uh, this site and the uh, supermarket that's two sites down, there's actually a self-storage facility uh, but the buildings themselves even block, you know, most of the, you know, available access. Okay. And, and do you, you want to jump in? Go ahead. I would just say it would normally be required, except the development of the lot next door makes it impossible. impossible. Right. Got it. Okay. You know, I mean, that's a, I think that's just an interesting uh, little tidbit. Okay. And then also on the city street. Um, so it is city owned, but not mapped. The record street. That's right. Uh, yeah, it's it's owned by the city. Um, it apparently was subdivided uh, in the 1920s uh, during the the economic heyday, um, and you know this street, along with a couple other streets you could see on the land use map, uh, were, were never used. Okay. Um, and the last question for me is the the uh, the finding for the special permit that the. Um, the curb cuts be more than 100 feet apart. You have two curb cuts on this map. They are 100 feet apart, and they, from your perspective, meet the findings for this special permit? Yes, they are at opposite ends of the uh, open parking lot, so over 400 feet, and uh, fulfilled, you know, we believe, the, uh, the finding to, to provide that uh, you know a way out um, for either cars or emergency vehicles. Okay. All right. Great, Commissioner Benjamin. I have a couple of questions about the parking. Um, the first one is that in this drawing, um, which drawing is it? Drawing on um, my fifteen. It appears that the drive-through parking, uh, drive-through area is only 11 feet wide, but it also appears that traffic that's coming in from Warner that's parking between retail and the bank would have to traverse this and then go through the drive-through along with the cars that want to do their banking there. Is that... Correct. Uh, I, when you say coming off of Warner Street, um, yes, there's a parking, there's a drive, a curb cut on Warner. Um, I don't know if we can. Uh, this isn't showing up very well. The laser okay, pointer so, works on that one there, Barry. It doesn't oh, work on that. Oh, okay, for thanks. whatever reason. Okay, so so yeah, so, so uh, yeah, people can. Uh, this is all two ways. So people could come in from Warner Street also. Right, That's right, and if if they wanted to go to the drive-through, they, they would go down this drive aisle, perhaps, and then well, uh, this go into shows it. that they can go down the parking where the parking area is, oh, right you mean there. Here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There, there's actually a, a small landscaped island to uh, to, yeah. to kind of organize the traffic and and direct direct people around where there's a little bit more queue waiting space. So so, so they would actually have to skip this first it's aisle and then take this aisle here. Okay. Number two, you show the loading berth. So is the yeah, the, the first? Yeah, the, the loading berths are, are here. Correct. And the access is the? Uh, yeah, the primary access is from Veterans Road West. So, so, so they would probably uh, come up, come in through this way and, and back in. Or, or, if, or if they found it easier, they could, they could also 
you know, use this as an entrance. But it's in general, the idea is that uh, vehicles would, would come in here easily from veterans. It just or seems if there are large trucks coming in, uh-huh. that that's going to be a choke point as the truck either backs into that loading berth and goes around the curve mm-hmm. or so fronts in here. and then has to try and back out and go some other way. Um, you may want to ask the developer to look at how many movements, since that's going to be a retail operation, presumably with deliveries, whether there's a better solution for how trucks come and go or whether they would want to separate deliveries into a time when the retail is not open um, or some other solution that doesn't involve stopping all of the other traffic activity on the site so the truck can get in or out. Uh-huh. Uh, yes, that's, that's a good, you know, that's good thinking uh, and a good, great question. I will uh, pass that on to the applicant. I know, you know, we had talked about this um, regarding the, the landscaping uh, as well. Um, so I, I believe they've done analysis, uh, but I will pass on this concern to them and uh, that they can discuss it at the um, public meeting as well. Okay. Cause and it also seems like the landscaping, and maybe it's on a different level, but at the rendering I'm looking at, you can't tell that. It seems as if the trees and some other landscaping elements would be blocking the driveway. So that may just be the drafting of this, but that would be a problem. Yeah, yeah, I, I, it's I. Uh, it is true that that there is. I I, I know they they uh, did think about this. Uh, and I'm just, I'm it, it does right kind through. of it does kind of point to the idea that they would come in from the side entrance and then back in, so that way they have some angle there, and then we can. But with that on. little architectural element there, that's mm-hmm. going to be a pretty. If it's a truck that's a, anything bigger than van size. I think the only way they can do that is to head all the way up and then back and try and get around because I don't think they can get around if they just come in from Warner. We we can have the applicant speak to what the double loading situation would look like as well as what time they would anticipate the loading actually occurring. The only thing we'd add is that FDNY has reviewed these plans, so this, this access is acceptable for, for their trucks. Um, but but yeah, we can we can have the applicant speak to their their turning radius and their and their loading plans. These are great flags. Thanks. And uh, if they could just correct the drawings, it looks like they're doing some type of landscaping and swaling or something mm-hmm. in the parking lot. Is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. They have uh, the the um, open uh, parking lots do require landscaped islands and. Uh, as part of that, the, the islands are, uh, rather than being raised to, to the top of the curb, they're sunken below so that uh, they can be also serve as uh, stormwater management. Uh, so that way not, you know, all uh, water has to go in through a, like a, some kind of physical infrastructure uh, and, and meant to be more of a, you know, a greener approach, uh, more environmentally uh, holistic approach to stormwater management. So that is part of... Uh, this this design as well. Okay, if you could let them know that we're going, at least I'm going to want them to explain more and to have a better diagram of the parking and landscaping and the interrelationship between how the cars will be channeled and trucks as a separate issue. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner. Here. Commissioner Cerullo. Just a, a Barry. Thank you, Hi, Katie. Just a quick question. How is Warner going to operate? Uh, I'm assuming this is a one-way in? It's, it's a... Uh, I'll it's, call it in, you know, one-way. It, it's, it's a two-way. Two so, it is a two-way. So, yeah. so, okay. And <laughs> No, no, no. I, I just wondered because if you come up... Will there be an indication that the only access point on this block is to get into the parking lot? That's that's what I'm saying. As okay. opposed to somebody who might be driving up the block, then it's a dead end because right, it hits the park at the end. Oh, is that correct? 
Yes, that's right. So if someone comes up the street that doesn't, makes a mistake, would have to go either make a U-turn at the end or go into the parking lot and an exit through the parking lot. Yes, that's a great point. So it's it's not a through street is what I'm saying. Will there be any indication, since it's a two-way street, that it's not a through street? Yes, of course, that, that's Department of Buildings, uh, uh, you know, area of expertise. Uh, you know, we, we see dead end signs. That, that's probably something that they would go here, but it's definitely something that we'll, you know, we'll check yeah, out. Yeah, only, only for just so that it's clear, you know, this is, and we know this, obviously I know this area very well, because it's also off the outer bridge. The, you have people who don't know the area who could think they're turning into a street to go in a different direction and just want to avoid any possibility where you have that, um, you know, sort of a conflict of people driving in that don't really want to be in that block at all. Um, yeah. Okay. Yes, we'll definitely, we'll, we'll definitely. Uh, okay. Very good. All right. Thank you. Yeah. I just, just had a question about that and I know this is going out to the public, but I know this is also a long time coming. So, Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Sorio. And thank you, Chair. Thanks for the presentation. Just a quick question, and maybe, again, for, for further discussion once this comes back to the Commission. But it sounds like during the EAS, the LPC found that there may be archaeologically significant um, resources here, yet the WRP marked this as uh, not applicable for uh, historic or archaeological resources. So it would be interesting to understand why that discrepancy? Okay, so uh, I, if, if I, the, to summarize, the, the LPC identified uh, uh, historic resources. Yes. There's the a possibility uh, of yes. Mm-hmm. Well, typically, the, uh, the when that finding is found um, by LPC, the applicant would have would have a follow-up response and potentially engagement with LPC to, to give more background. So we'll have to ask them to respond to that. But Great. Thank you. Yeah, you know, the, the um, EAS also has a, uh, in the appendix, um, a chapter on the history of the site, which, which you know, that carries it uh, back to, you know, the, the first settlement. So, um, and uh, and uh, that should be accessible. Um, and it's you know interesting to look at, so we can uh, you know ask the applicant to to clarify too. Thanks so much. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are now certified on Warner Street, and uh, we will move on to the next item in a new borough here, Ryan. Yes. Uh, so the fifth item on our agenda is a referral of a non ULERP modification to a previously approved authorization in the Bronx Community District 1, our presenter is Manny Lagares. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Hello, Manny. Okay, this is the uh, Christopher Court project, which is uh, before you for certification. The applicant is Catholic Homes, and they are requesting a non euler modification of the Melrose large-scale residential development to facilitate the construction of the Christopher Park apartments on site D3 of the Melrose Large Scale Residential Development. The development site is located in the Melrose neighborhood of Bronx Community District Number One. On September 24, 1969, by CPC resolution, New York City created the Melrose Urban Renewal Area for a 20 block area in the Melrose neighborhood of the Bronx. The Urban Renewal Area was bounded by East 153rd Street, 3rd Avenue, East 145th Street, College Avenue, East 148th Street, Morris Avenue, East 149th Street, Park Avenue, and Morris Avenue. Between 1969 and 2004, the city approved a series of land use actions to facilitate the redevelopment of the urban renewal area with residential, commercial, institutional, and recreational uses. Also on September 24, 1969, uh, pursuant to CPC resolution, the City of New York established an urban renewal plan for four sites within the urban renewal area, Site A, Site B, Site C, and Site D. Sites A and B were to be developed with low-rent public housing. The regulations of Chapter 8 of the Zoning Resolution of 1961 as amended, governing large-scale residential developments were proposed to be applied 
to site C and D. The Melrose Urban Renewal Area and Plan expired on May 21, uh, 2010. On October 11, 1972, by CPC resolution, the CPC amended the Urban Renewal Plan to divide Parcel D into parcels uh, D1, D2, and D3. Site E was divided into sites E and E1. The amended plan specified that the development of the six sites in the westerly portion of the Urban Renewal Plan, which are C, D1, D2, D3, E, and D1, were to be redeveloped in accordance with a large-scale residential development plan. Additionally, this amended urban renewal plan proposed an R72 with a C4 overlay zoning district for sites D1, D2, and D3, and confirmed that sites E and E1 were located in the R71 zoning district. The aerial map indicates the boundaries of the large-scale residential development. That's the Melrose uh, our scale residential development plan in the dash blue line, and it contains the six sites which I previously read. Site C is senior housing. Site D1 contains the Michelangelo apartments. The site D2 contains the Maria Lopez residential development. Site D3 is the subject of this application and contains the Christopher Court apartments. Site D3 is bounded by East 151st Street on the north. Morris Avenue on the east, an alleyway and Eastman to the south, and Park Avenue forms the western boundary. The Alfred E. Smith Playground is located on Sites E and D1. Site E was intended for a community center, and Site E1 was intended for senior housing. These sites were never developed and were never removed from the large-scale residential development. The area map indicates site D3, the development site, which is outlined in red. This block contains the Christopher Court apartments, which were constructed in 1982. This development consists of two six-story low-income residential buildings with 160 dwelling units and a 48-acre, 48-space accessory parking lot. The area is zoned R72 with a C14 commercial overlay fronting on Morris Avenue. R72 is a medium density residential zoning district with a maximum residential FAR of 3.44. It also allows community facilities with an FAR of 6.5. The C14 allows commercial uses with an FAR of 2. This is a view looking northwest at the development site. You can see the uh, parking lot on the west. That's uh, an accessory parking lot to the uh, two six-story buildings, which is Christopher Court Apartments, and one of the buildings of the Christopher Court development. The next slide is a view looking in the other direction, northeast, at the two buildings of the Christopher Court development. As you can see there were trees and grass as the open space. This is the proposed site plan, which shows the two existing six-story, 160-unit Section 8 buildings of Christopher Court. Uh, Christopher Court's 48-space accessory parking lot will be relocated from the southwestern portion to the southeastern portion of the block. Uh, this drawing, as you can see, the proposed building footprint is located on where the existing accessory parking lot to Christopher Court is. And again, that will be relocated to the uh, southeastern corner of the block. The site plan also shows the footprint of, okay, I have that already, 30 of these uh, The development will contain 200 income-restricted units. 30 of these units will be set aside for previously homeless persons and supported services for these units will be provided by Catholic charities. The ground floor of the building will have an accessory community room and laundry, also shown is the new open space, which will consist of play areas, a sitting area, a garden for residents, trees, and a lawn area. The proposed modification facilitates the construction of the Christopher Park apartments by updating the large-scale residential development site plan and zoning calculations. Uh, for example, and this is in your package, there is a uh, 
uh, zoning uh, calculations in your package, but I'll just touch on a few. Uh, in the large scale, it has a capacity uh, regarding dwelling units of 494 units. The proposed development, which is for 200 units, plus the previously approved one, 160, issued 360. So that's within that capacity. It's not going over. Uh, the floor area ratio, is the capacity of the large scale is 3.17. With the proposed development, is 3.01, still under. The high factor has a high factor of eight. Uh, the capacity, the development, the old development, and the new development, still eight. And the residential floor area, the large scale has a capacity of 335,994, and the proposed development plus the previous development is 323,000, 208 below. There are findings that the City Planning Commission has to make in their review of this application recommendation that such modification will allow greater flexibility for the purpose of securing better site planning for development of vacant land and provide incentives towards that end while safeguarding the present or future use and development of the surrounding areas. That's uh, finding A. B, that such distribution of floor area, dwelling units, open space, location of buildings will permit better site planning and will benefit the residents of the large scale and the city as a whole. Finding C, that such distribution or location will not unduly increase the bulk of buildings, density of population, or intensity of use in any block to the detriment of the occupants of buildings in the block or nearby blocks. And the finding D, that such distribution or location will not affect adversely any other zoning lots outside the large scale residential development by restricting access to light and air or by creating traffic congestion. There are six findings, the other two are not applicable. And the next slide is what the building will look like. This is again, proposed 13-story residential development at a height of 119 feet. The approximately 172,000 square foot development will have two 16-foot front yards and a 30-foot rear yard. The apartment distribution is 85 storey units 102 two-bedroom units, and 13 three-bedroom units. There will be a 16-foot setback on the 10th floor for a terrace for use by the residents of the Christopher Park apartments. The roof will contain solar panels and a green roof as shown on the rendering. Parking will not be provided because the site is located within a transit zone, which does not require parking. That is my presentation. I'll be very happy to answer any questions. Excellent. Thank you, Manny. Okay. okay. Uh, Commissioner Kamani. Thank you so much for your presentation. Just a quick question. Would love okay. to know from the applicant you know, the, the, the decision making and the, the relatively no, low number of three bedroom apartments. Okay. Yes. I will convey that information. By the way, the applicant is here. The applicant wanted to know the questions that the commission has, okay. and we'll be taking notes. Great, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Anybody else? Okay, thank you very much, Manny. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, this one is referred to the community board for 45 days. Ryan? Excuse me, Chair, I'm raising my hand. It's not being acknowledged. Oh, I'm I very sorry. I'm sorry. No, I know that, I know that. Mr. No, Marty, okay. I, I can hear your voice, though, so uh, yes. the floor yes. is yours. I'm sorry. Okay. No, it's quite all right. I, I know you didn't see me on the screen. Hello, hello, Manny. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Hi. Manny, so um, I did have the same question that Commissioner Kermani asked. Um, there's a large amount of number one of uh, one bedrooms, and I think the proportions are off based on the community and the family sizes within the community. So thank you for that. Um, okay. The second thing is that you mentioned something that was critical in my study of this application, and I'm trying to figure out, and I kind of figured, I, I think I know what the answer is, but you mentioned that this building will not 
have any parking because it is in a transit rich area, which I happen to agree it is. Uh, plenty okay. of buses going down 149th Street, of course, Melrose, and then uh, the train at Gun Hill, uh, excuse me, at, Con at the concourse. So why would we be, or why would the applicant be relocating the parking for the six story buildings? Um, uh, that's all I'm questioning because that presents the opportunity of providing more housing without it. Okay, the, the applicant is here and uh, they have the information and we'll get back to the commission when it returns. So I'll defer to, you know, to their response. Thank you, man. You're welcome. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, and I can Thank see you, you now, at least for the moment. So hello. Hello, Commissioners. I can see you all out there. All right, Ryan, let's move on. Okay. The sixth item on our agenda is a pre-hearing review of a zoning map and zoning text amendment in Brooklyn Community District 13. Our presenter is Joel Miller. I will note that, uh, for the record, that Commissioner Ron Fashad is recused on this item. Good afternoon, Commissioners. 58, Nixing Court's rezoning application. Should I wait for the presentation to be uploaded? Uh, we're getting it up. Yeah, okay. I can see. I can see him working on it. <laughs> but, yeah, go ahead. 58 Nixon Court's rezoning application was certified in October of 2022, and today the application is back for pre-hearing. This is a private application from SLG Assets for a zoning map amendment and zoning text amendment to facilitate the development of a new nine-story, approximately 20,300 square feet mixed-use residential and commercial building in Graves in Brooklyn. The proposal includes construction of 21 dwelling units, including five MIH units, and approximately 1,800 square feet of residential space and 1,700 square feet of retail space. The applicant is pursuing a zoning map amendment to rezone the project area from an R5 district to a R7X and R7X C24 district within the Special Ocean Parkway district and a zoning text amendment and a zoning text amendment to amend Appendix F to designate the development site as a mandatory inclusionary housing area. This is a view of the surrounding area looking north. So the project area is located along Ocean Parkway in between Murdoch and Nixon Court. The development site is located on the corner of Nixon Court and Shore Parkway. The F-Line Neptune Avenue station is located approximately half a mile from the development site and multiple bus lines serve the project area and travel, from, travel to Kingsborough Community College, Bay Ridge, Sheepshead Bay, and Coney Island. Portions of the project area are within the high-risk flood zone, and the applicant's flood zone mitigation plans include locating habitable spaces above the flood hazard eleva elevation level and ensuring all mechanical systems are located abo also above the design flood elevation levels. And they plan on dry flood proofing all commercial and Cellar spaces with removable barriers. So this is a view of the proposed development site facing west from Ocean Parkway. And this is a view of Ocean Park, excuse me, of the development site facing northeast from Shore Parkway. The applicant proposes a zoning text amendment to a amend Appendix F to designate the area highlighted in gray as a mandatory inclusionary housing area. I realize on that screen it doesn't really show up, but it's the area within the black border. So within MIH option one, the applicant's proposal, proposal sets aside 25% of the housing units produced as affordable at 60% AMI. So the applicant's proposal will provide five MIH units out of the total 21 units produced. So two units will be provided at 40% AMI, two units will be provided at 60% AMI, and then one unit will be provided at 80% AMI, and then the other 16 units will be produced at market rate. And I'll leave this up for a second so that you can see the rent breakdowns for a studio and two bedroom apartment.
So the community board 13 voted on this application in November of last year and the board voted to disapprove the application. The Brooklyn Borough President voted on the application in December of last year and voted to approve the application with modifications. Modifications include retaining a qualified administering agent for the 58 Nixon Court MIH lottery, incorporating resiliency and sustainability measures such as blue slash green roof, excuse me, green roofs, installing rain gardens in the required landscaped front yard, and retaining Brooklyn-based contractors and suppliers. Thank you, and I'm open to any questions you have. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, let, let's just talk for a minute about um, the proposed uh, designation uh, as, as an R7X here. Um, my understanding is that this is uh, in the Special Ocean Parkway District, but it is a, an outlier and that the building's right already in the vicinity are out of context with what that district was intended to protect. Is that is that right? That is correct. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah. So basically, the building to the right, um, it is not within the Special Ocean Parkway District rules. Um, as a quick reminder, the Special Ocean Parkway District was to, like, kind of keep a certain character and um, to, like, kind of keep out high-density projects. And so the building to the right of the, of the development site is already, um, it's like over six stories. And then you have across the street, adjacent, adjacent to the development site, you have the high density NYC health hospitals. So you already have two um, large development sites already there, not in, within the constraints of the Special Ocean Parkway District rules. And the other building that would be part of the rezoning area, that's the building that you were citing in the first example. Is that correct? In the photo that I showed you? Go ahead. Let's take a look. Okay. Which, which, uh, okay. yeah, actually, that's the one I'm talking about right there. <laughs> okay. That's it. You can see it. I can okay, see it. There we it's go. All that matters. There it is. Okay. Go ahead. That building. Describe, so what yeah. is the what's the the situation with that? That um, is uh, that looks like a, an approximately the same size as what's being proposed here. Is that right? So I don't remember off the top of my head how many stories this building is, but it's bigger than nine. Right, right, three, bigger four, than nine. Five, um, six, seven, eight, twelve, thirteen. Okay. So then, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? And that is also part of this rezoning area, correct? Correct. And the the R7X would bring that into compliance, compliance. with zoning mm -hmm. where it today is out of compliance. Correct. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. um, okay, got it. Thank you. If there are other questions for you. Commissioner Kamrani. Thanks for the presentation. Um, just I noticed in the, in the packet, it, um, where the community board voted against it, there was a note that the lawyer was going to present an alternative proposal. Did that meeting happen, and will we be hearing about that? So I don't believe that meeting has happened quite yet. I'm going to ask sure. my team lead to join me. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so at the public hearing, the, um, the land, use, land use attorney had mentioned that there could be, you know, other zoning districts that could be appropriate here in addition to what was proposed and what was in the application and said that they would return to the community to talk about that proposal. Um, I don't believe that's taken place yet, but they are going to be talking about that at the public hearing. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Goodridge. I, I actually wanted some uh, oh, in Oh, sorry. Thank you. I actually, oh, is that, thank you. I actually wanted some insight as to why the community board voted no. They didn't really say it in the packet. And yeah, it's didn't. a small proposal, and you know, it's not a hundred percent affordable housing, but it's also a very small building. So I'm wondering if there's any insight as to why. Yeah. So the community board had some concerns about um, density being lifted in this area, and so that the constraints 
the tight constraints of the Special Ocean Parkway District would be lifted in this case, and just some concerns about den higher density buildings. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Sario. Thank you for the presentation. I had a question about the, I know that the Borough President uh, recommended working with uh, the Office of Emergency Management and developing some type of um, emergency preparedness, but also evacuation procedures, protocols. I, I, that was a concern that I had raised the first time that we looked at it, given the lack of or the limited public access that exists, to, to, limited access to public transit that exists in the area. And I was wondering, you know, from your analysis, like what's your take on that? And, and if you can share any details in terms of how that conversation has if developed with the applicant. My, let me just, I just want to make sure I understand correctly. How do I feel about if this area is exactly. served well by transit? It, well, how will this, uh, the increase in density, how will this, the residents be evacuated in the case of an emergency given uh, the lack of pol access to public transit? I, I understand. Okay. So that's a great question. I'm actually going to write that down and pass that along to the applicant. Thank you. Yeah, and when, when the applicant comes back, it will be great to see the extent to which some of the other recommendations around uh, sustainability measures uh, and green roofs, et cetera, are being implemented. Okay. Or considered. <laughs> Thank you. Understood. Right, thank you, Commissioner. Okay, well, we will uh, be hearing this one again soon. This will be up for a public hearing this Wednesday, and we'll follow up with the applicant at that time. Thank you very much, Joel. Ryan? Sure. Uh, so we have the seventh item on our agenda, which is a city council modification scope determination uh, for the reform temple of Forest Hills rezoning. Uh, the city council proposes to modify the zoning text amendment to strike out MIH option two, leaving only option one. Uh, staff believe that this modification is within scope. Great. Any questions there? Okay. Thanks, Ryan. We don't need to. We can, oh, we can, oh great. It's a show of hands. Are we hands. ready now? Yeah, Does anybody have any comments? I was going to do them together. All right. Oh, let's you want to do, do them together? Yeah, let's just do okay, them together. I'll call the next one. Then. Let's okay. do 446, yeah. 448 Park Avenue, yeah, too. Yeah, it, it's, uh, so f this is a city council uh, modification scope determination for 446, 448 Park Avenue rezoning. And the city council, again, proposes to modify the zoning text amendment to strike out MIH option two, leaving only option one. Option one is, um, what's the difference? Uh, can you hear the question? The question yeah, was, yeah. can you describe the, the what option one would so do? That's option one, is it, sure. is it more or less affordable housing? That's what it's it's um, deeper affordable, 20% at a deeper affordability versus uh, more affordable floor area, but at a higher incomes are allowed. Okay, so those are the two items. Uh, staff notes and recommends that the, we believe that the, those modifications are within scope. Uh, I'm, I'm deviating from prior practice and I'm grouping these two together for a dissent by voice vote to in fact recognize that these modifications are within scope. So uh, all those in favor of so finding on calendars number eight and nine, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, moving on, we have future future votes. So for February 1st, uh, 2023, we have uh, 521 East Tremont Avenue rezoning. Uh, staff, as you'll recall, is recommending approval of this. Uh, it is a uh, wide street uh, in an area near transit and uh, it will facilitate uh, both affordable housing and the continued operation of a community facility that's already there. Um, also uh, scheduled for vote are the Samuel Gompers Industrial High School. This is a standalone uh, landmark in the South Bronx and the Julius Barr Building, which is a standalone landmark designation in uh, Manhattan's Greenwich Village. Uh, and then also uh, 75 Hilltop Terrace, which are which is a uh, zoning authorizations pursuant to the special natural area district. No questions on those. Okay, so we have uh, post hearing follow ups. We have the Flatbush Avenue bid, and Alex is here just to quickly talk about um, the agency's recommendation. Great, thank you. Hi, Alex. Hello, commissioners. Uh, Chair, thank you. Um, 
My name is Alex Plax with the Economic Development and Regional Planning Division. Um, I just want to say that the department is recommending the approval of the amended district plan of the Business Improvement District. Uh, we believe the change will help create a single unified business improvement district for the Church Avenue, Flatbush Avenue area, allowing for the proposed bid to focus on providing greater levels of service and reducing duplications of expenses and staff effort. Great. And Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, the Otis Elevator Building, uh, this is 260 11th Avenue. Uh, Commissioner Cirillo is recused on this item. I'll note that for the record. And Andy is here uh, to discuss the agency's recommendation. Good afternoon, Commission. Um, so this is scheduled for a vote on February 15th. Uh, staff is supportive of this application. We feel that it's a surgical intervention to help facilitate <laughs> a contextual expansion of a historic building that the LPC has already uh, approved. Um, we feel that the change is consistent with the built character of the surrounding area and the intent of the special West Chelsea District bulk regulations. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Andy. Question from Commissioner Buzzard. I have a question unrelated to this. So it's... Okay, well, let's see if there's anything here. I don't think that there is. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, just before we wrapped up, I wanted to just flag, because we started with the historic designation and then heard a bunch of projects, um, some for increased density, that I'm starting to think that, at least from my personal view, and I know I'm hoping we can discuss at some point the level of information we get for these historic designations, because um, I know, you know, for when we're increasing density, we have all this great information in the racial equity reports to kind of consider the impact but we don't really have that equivalent when we're taking actions that prohibit future development. And that's absent. I mean, that's obviously independent from the LPC's consideration of the, you know, you know, I mean, the, yeah, exactly. The historicity and the, you know, the information we're reading is really more about that and less about um, kind of the potential, what, what this means for the neighborhood and the city and the community board. And I know, you know, our, purview on those is narrow, I understand, but there is this broad statement about whether it impacts future or any current projects or known development or growth. And without a citywide framework, we can't really answer that question, I think, holistically. So at some point, I'd love if we could just discuss whether there's the possibility of just getting more detailed information about the way the neighborhood has changed um, and uh, well, not necessarily the degree that we get in the racial equity reports, but additional data that could help us consider the potential impact of restricting future development. I think that's a fair point, and thank you for uh, for making it, and we will talk yeah. about how we can incorporate that in going forward. We have not had too many of these, I would note, in the last year, at least since I've been around. But yes, we should certainly talk about that. Commissioner, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. I, I did have a question about the Otis elevator, but maybe, Ryan, if you can uh, follow up on that. At the last meeting, I had asked about the vulnerability of the building to flooding, and uh, there was there was supposed to be some follow up with sure. the applicant. I was wondering if, if possible, if you can let me know what we was the can, outcome. Yeah, of we that. can follow up on that. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, and just on on the uh, the uh, question of the uh, historic districts, I do want to note that for historic districts that are over four blocks in size, a racial equity report will be required. We haven't seen one of those since since it uh, came to pass, but it will be required. And we can take a look also at just what we're providing in our briefing uh, materials. They're, Great. They're performing at this point. Thank you very much, Ryan. And with that, uh, we will adjourn for the day. We will see you all back here at 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning. Thanks, everybody.